Every vision begins with a spark of inspiration, and every inspiration is driven by the passion to realize dreams. Becoming a world-class institution in research, sciences, and innovation to improve the nation's competitiveness is our vision at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI. LIPI has various research centers throughout Indonesia under the coordination of the chairman of LIPI, Deputy for Life Sciences, Deputy for Earth Sciences, Deputy for Engineering Sciences, Deputy for Social and Humanity Sciences, and Deputy for Scientific Services. LIPI has a pivotal role in drafting and establishing government regulations and policies related to economic, political, social, and cultural aspects. LIPI also manages scientific data and scientific considerations on biodiversity conservation as well as the publication of global indexed scientific journals and also appointed as a scientific authority in coaching national researchers and hosting the inauguration of Indonesian research professors. To support world-class research activities, LIPI managed five botanic gardens as a center for ex situ plant conservation three museums that have the biggest collection of flora and fauna specimens in Southeast Asia and regional level and Indonesian natural history. Barunajaya 8 research vessel, Indonesia cultural collection, which keeps the largest collection of microorganisms in Indonesia, and two international centers, namely Asia Pacific Center for Eco-Hydrology, APCE, and Regional Training and Research Center on Marine Biodiversity and Ecosystem Health, <laughs> RTRC Marbest Center. LIPI has produced qualified research results that are beneficial to the society, including biodiversity, environment and maritime, food security, agriculture and farm, health and pharmacy, advanced material, energy, technology, information and communication, social dynamics, humanity and culture, technology innovation and utilization of science and technology, as well as scientific services, testing and development. LIPI's national scientific collaborations include collaborative research, technology licensing, development, application, and commercialization of research results, non-research collaborations, LIPI's expertise consulting, scientific coaching for youth, students, and teachers with various universities, research institutions, local governments, and industry. As for international collaborations, LIPI conducts joint research, joint laboratories, symposium, workshops, international conferences, exchanges for researchers and experts, as well as international scholarships, while being active as a member and a focal point in various international organizations. LIPI will keep continuing to strengthen national platforms by developing world-class researchers and building scientific collaborations to make great impacts on the nation's competitiveness. Indonesia merupakan negara kepulauan yang didominasi perairan, terdiri dari lautan, danau, sungai, bendungan, waduk, rawa, dan sebagainya. Berbicara tentang perairan darat, Indonesia memiliki banyak danau yang indah dan mempunyai sejuta manfaat bagi masyarakat. Mulai dari air, 
flora, fauna, dan lainnya. Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia, atau yang lebih dikenal dengan LIPI, memiliki beberapa pusat penelitian dan pengembangan. Salah satunya adalah Pusat Penelitian Limnologi. Limnologi merupakan cabang ilmu yang mempelajari ekosistem perairan darat dan interaksi antar penyusun komponennya. Limnologi juga mengintegrasikan kajian-kajian terkait dengan siklus hara, produktivitas biologi, biodiversitas, dan adaptasinya. Kajian tersebut digunakan untuk mengevaluasi bagaimana komponen fisika, biologi, dan kimia saling berinteraksi dalam ekosistem perairan darat. Keseluruhan kajian tersebut digunakan untuk mendukung penyusunan kebijakan dalam mengelola lingkungan perairan darat. Pusat Penelitian Limpologi LIPI dibentuk melalui SK Presiden nomor 1986 dengan nama Pusat Penelitian dan Pengembangan Limnologi yang berada di bawah Kedeputian Bidang Ilmu Pengetahuan Alam, IPA. Melalui keputusan Presiden nomor 178 tahun 2000 dan Surat Keputusan Kepala LIPI nomor 1151 garis miring M garis miring 2001 mengalami perubahan nama menjadi Pusat Penelitian Limnologi yang berada di bawah Kedeputian Bidang Ilmu Pengetahuan Kebumian IPK. Sebagai pertimbangan dan pemikiran didirikannya institusi ini adalah kepentingan dan kebutuhan akan penelitian di bidang ilmu pengetahuan alam di Indonesia serta mewujudkan pengelolaan sumber daya perairan darat, biodiversitas, dan ketahanan air yang berwawasan lingkungan melalui kemampuan IPTEC untuk mendorong peningkatan perekonomian masyarakat. Berdasarkan peraturan Kepala Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia nomor 1 tahun 2019 tertanggal 7 Januari 2019 tentang organisasi dan tata kerja Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia, Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI memiliki tugas pokok dan fungsi melaksanakan penyiapan perumusan dan pelaksanaan kebijakan, pemberian bimbingan teknis dan supervisi, pemantauan, evaluasi, dan pelaporan di bidang penelitian limnologi serta pelaksanaan urusan tata usaha. Pusat Penelitian Limnologi dikepalai oleh pejabat setingkat Eselon II. Struktur organisasi Pusat Penelitian Limnologi terdiri atas bidang pengelolaan penelitian dan subbagian tata usaha yang meliputi Kepala Pusat Penelitian, Bidang Pengelolaan Penelitian, Subbagian Tata Usaha, Kelompok Jabatan Fungsional. Guna mengefektifkan bidang pengelolaan penelitian, maka dalam pelaksanaan kegiatan penelitian dibentuk enam kelompok penelitian atau keltian yang mendukung tugas dan fungsi Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI. Kelompok Penelitian Konservasi Ekosistem Perairan Darat melingkupi kajian, daya dukung ekosistem, monitoring lingkungan, dinamika populasi, zonasi pemanfaatan ekosistem, jasa lingkungan dan valuasi ekonomi, kelompok penelitian dinamika pencemaran dan pemulihan kualitas perairan darat, melingkupi kajian, dinamika polutan, ekotoksikologi, bioindikator kualitas perairan, teknologi pemulihan kualitas air, Kelompok Penelitian Rekayasa Sumber Daya Perairan Darat Melingkupi Kajian Teknologi Produksi Biota Lokal Rekayasa Habitat Ekosistem Domestikasi Biota Kelompok Penelitian Mitigasi Bencana Perairan Darat Melingkupi Kajian Analisis Risiko atau Dampak Bencana Hidrometeorologi pada Ekosistem Perairan Strategi atau Konsep Mitigasi Bencana Lingkungan Kelompok Penelitian Sistem Cerdas Manajemen Perairan Darat Melingkupi Kajian Pemodelan Sistem Perairan Pengembangan Sistem Pemantauan Lingkungan Secara Online Pengembangan Basis Data dan Sistem Pendukung atau DSS untuk Manajemen Pemanfaatan Sumber Daya Kelompok Penelitian Dinamika Proses Perairan Darat Melingkupi Kajian Biogeokimia Perairan Limnologi Fisik Paleolimnologi Pada tahun 2019, total sumber daya manusia yang dimiliki Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI sebanyak 82 orang yang terbagi menjadi dua bagian, yaitu 77 orang sumber daya IPTEC yang memiliki jabatan fungsional peneliti, prekayasa, dan litkayasa 
untuk mendukung pencapaian kinerja puslit, serta 5 orang sumber daya pendukung IPTEC. Sarana dan prasarana yang dimiliki oleh Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI terdiri dari satu gedung administrasi dan dua gedung untuk sarana laboratorium serta ruang kerja SDM IPTEC. Laboratorium yang dimiliki oleh Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI meliputi Laboratorium Bioakuatik Laboratorium Sedimentologi Laboratorium Mikrobiologi Laboratorium Genetika Laboratorium Toksikologi Laboratorium Hidroinformatika Laboratorium Fisiologi Laboratorium Planktonologi Laboratorium Hidrokimia atau Laboratorium Akreditasi 17025 Ruang Khusus Mikroskop dan Laboratorium Alam Situ Cibuntu Untuk membangun jejaring ilmiah yang lebih luas Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI melakukan kegiatan-kegiatan pertemuan ilmiah baik melalui seminar nasional dan internasional konferensi di dalam dan di luar negeri Hasil-hasil penelitian Pusat Penelitian Limnologi LIPI disebarluaskan melalui berbagai media secara offline dan online seperti pameran, jurnal, naskah akademik, hingga media sosial. Kerjasama tim, komitmen, dan kegigihan yang kami bangun membuahkan apresiasi baik dari kancah nasional maupun internasional. Pusat Penelitian Limnologi hadir untuk masyarakat Indonesia dengan mengelola sumber daya perairan darat yang lestari guna terwujudnya kehidupan masyarakat yang mandiri, cerdas, kreatif, dan integratif. Unmute. We will start now. Yeah, please. Okay. Everyone, we will start now. Honorable Director of Research Center for Limnology, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI, Dr. Fauzan Ali, Head of Science and Technology. Division of ASEAN Secretariat, Dr. Michelle Chu. The focal points of the Subcommittee on Marine Science and Technology of ASEAN, Dr. Augie Sahelatua. Distinguished speaker, Professor Wan Masnahwan Omar, the lecturer of University Science Malaysia, Dr. Luki Subahi, senior researcher of Research Center for Limnology LIPI, Ms. Adelina Santos Borja, the chairperson of Southeast ASEAN Limnological Network, SILNET, Ms. Kantafang Intafong, the lecturer of National University of Laos, Professor Masahisa Nakamura, the, the Vice President of International Lake Environment Committee Foundation, ILEC, Honorable, the member of ASEAN Subcommittee on Science and Technology, the member of Southeast ASEAN Limnological Network, SILNET, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Imratu Solihah. I'm a researcher in the Research Center for Limnology, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI. And today I will be your host and moderator for this webinar. Thank you to the committee for having me today. And first of all, I would like to express my gratitude for ASEAN, the Committee on Science and Technology, Research Center for Limnology, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI, Southeast ASEAN Limnological Network, SILNET, 
Indonesian Society of Limnology MLI, who organized this webinar on Limno Series 2020, entitled ASEAN Talks in Landwater Ecosystem, with the theme Current Challenges in the Conservation of Tropical Inland Water Ecosystem in the ASEAN Region. Toward the second international conference on tropical limnology that will be held on November 18 to 20, 2020. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, as we know together that tropical inland water has been faced by several problems, including water pollution, eutrophication, and also sanitation, and the problem could be immensely different from subtropical ecosystem. Water in tropical region has become so vulnerable and critical in the last decades with the distinctive challenges and also opportunities compared to the problem in the subtropical region. It is considered that on the one hand, tropical inland ecosystem play an important role in water storage. On the other hand, this receive a big stressor. The difference in interest between ecology and economy to be one of the main causes. Therefore, an interdisciplinary approach and collaboration between every tropical country will be needed to maintain the sustainable use of tropical inland water ecosystem. Regarding these needs, LIPI, ASEAN, SILNET, and also MLI organized this webinar to share experiences among tropical countries in the world especially for Southeast ASEAN countries, and also to get some lesson learned that can be beneficial for the management of tropical inland water ecosystem. This program supported by ILEC, USM, and also NUAL. As I mentioned before, we have some invited speaker, five invited speaker of scholar and colleges from Philippines, Malaysia, Laos, Japan and Indonesia to present their topic on the subject. First, I want to greet them here. Miss Adelina Santos Borgia from Philippines. Hello, Miss Lenny. Prof. Wan Masnahwan Omar from Malaysia. Hello, Prof. Wan. Dr. Luki Subahi from Indonesia. Hello, Dr. Luki. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Kantafah Intafong from Laos. Hello, Ms. Intafong. Professor Masahisa Nakamura from Japan. Hello, Professor Nakamura. And I would like to greet our participants also today. There are more than 400 participants have been registered to this webinar. Hello, everyone. And this is the profile of our participant. So our participant come from Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, India, Japan, Kenya, Laos, Germany, Myanmar, Peru, New Zealand, South Korea, Vietnam, Scotland, US, UK, and also Singapore. According to the job distribution, our attendants come from various background, from government institution, civil servant, researcher, lecturer, student, uh, etc. And 54% of our participants uh, already know about SILNET. So we will have a presentation session today and then followed by a discussion session. And for all of our participants, I would like to kindly remind you to, to mute the microphone and you can ask in the discussion session during and after the presentation from our speakers. For your information, this webinar is also live in YouTube channel. Okay, before we start with the presentation session, first I would like to invite the focal point of Subcommittee on Marine Science and Technology of ASEAN to give a webcam remarks. Dr. Augi Sahalatua, time is your. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the um, ASEAN Talks or Webinar Limno Series 2020. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, all panels, all community. Um, I would like to uh, 
appreciate and congratulate you all for uh, doing this uh, seminar as a focal point for uh, uh, marine science and uh, technology under the Asian coast under Asian coasting, I really appreciate this uh, event and I hope that this event could be give uh, benefit and uh, other mutual uh, contribution is not to uh, the region, but for the global. As we know that uh, Southeast Asian countries or uh, the region is uh, very, very important uh, in many aspects, especially if we understand the biodiversity in the region, um, ecosystem in the region. So the region is uh, recognized as a rich uh, ecosystem, including the inland uh, water ecosystem. So I hope this, uh, this webinar is not uh, the last and end, but it's like uh, we begin to uh, do some uh, collaboration. It's not just uh, for Indonesia, but for the region and it's also for the global. So, so once again, thank you very much everyone uh, for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. And I would like to thanks for uh, Research Center for Limnology to initiate uh, this webinar and Asian talk. So thank you very much and uh, welcome to the Asian talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for the welcome remarks, Dr. Augustin Latua. Now I would like to invite Dr. Michelle Chu, the head, the head of Division of Science and Technology, ASEAN Secretariat, to give welcome remarks and messages for our presenter and also our audience today. Dr. Michelle Chu, time is yours. Thank you very much, Ms. Moderator. So a very warm welcome to everyone, especially those who are from um, Germany, Scotland, Peru, and the US. So either good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. So a very warm welcome, and I'm very glad that there are many participants today, 185 as of now, and um, would like to congratulate uh, basically the organizing committee as well for inviting the ASEAN Secretariat to be part of this um, very warm and very sincere um, group of uh, interested participants and experts in limnology. And um, so when it first came to, to us, I think uh, we also thought that it would be a very um, important um, topic to talk about and to discuss. And hopefully from this event, we will make it into a um, topic that we will be, it will be sustainable. And we hope that it will go throughout, not just within the subcommittee on marine science and technology, but also within a top, a, an important topic within um, COSTI, which is the Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation. So without further ado, uh, I wish everyone uh, an extremely fruitful webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome, re uh, welcome remarks, uh, Dr. Chu. And let us continue. I would like to invite Dr. Fauzan Ali, the Director of Research Center for Limnology, LIPI, to give a welcome remarks and the opening remarks. So Dr. Fauzan Ali, I welcome you. Uh, still in mute. Okay. 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 Thank you, Im. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, everyone. Your, Excel Your Excel Excellency, Head of Science and Technology Division, ASEAN Secretariat, Honorable, the focal point of ASEAN Subcommittee of Marine Science and Technology, Honorable, the Chairperson of Southeast Asia Limnological Network, SILNET, Honorable, Vice Chairperson of International Lake Environment Committee, ILEC, Honorable, the members of ASEAN Committee 
and Science and Technology, COSTI, Honorable the members of Southeast Asian Limnological Network, CILNET, distinguished speakers, and ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to ASEAN Talks webinar about Indian water ecosystem. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, on behalf of Research Center for Limnology, LIPI, uh, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, I would like to express our gratitude <clears throat> to the ASEAN Committee on Science and Technology who had invited us to attend the ASEAN COSTI 77 meeting in Singapore in 2019 as participant under subcommittee on marine science and technology there. <clears throat> in the meeting, we had a chance to talk about the importance of inland water ecosystem and highlight some of most important issues that we think need to be accommodated by the subcommittee in ASEAN COSTI. We also would like to express our gratitude for ILEC, who together with the Research Center for Limnology, LIPI, has supported the establishment of SILNET, Southeast Asia Limnological Network, since the very beginning. The role of ILEC in inland water management has been recognized worldwide and their experience in management of tropical inland waters in several countries in South America and Africa has proven to be very valuable for other tropical countries in Asia. In the future, we hope that more collaborations in form of joint research projects will be established between ILEC, SILNET, and ASEAN countries. Ladies and gentlemen, water is the source of all life on Earth an indispensable resource for our activities. Inland water is in tropical regions in particular, is the home of numerous aquatic organisms and abiotic components that interact harmonically with each other. <clears throat> Although the Indian water is, represents a small portion out mm. of the total water globally, it is irrefutable that the inland water ecosystem caters to extensive range of goods and services. Because of this, the sustainability of the inland water ecosystem is central not only to the organism, but also to us, human beings. As human population grows every year, the demands of the demand upon the environment increase considerably. Urbanization, industrialization, agriculture, land use, and land cover chains can lead to the noticeable stress and threats of the various ecosystems, including the water ecosystems. In the future, we may deal with more decline and loss of wind and aquatic biodiversity. Maintaining an equilibrium between the societal demands and the attempts to sustain ecosystem function is uh, evidently challenging. Science and technology and knowledge are required to identify problems and offer solutions to our ecosystem sustainability. The inland water ecosystem of tropical areas is a very specific part of general water ecosystem, which has very distinctive characteristics as opposed to those in subtropical and temperate zones. Therefore, in order to stimulate discussion and development in the area of inland water management and to obtain more global recognition, a particular forum for promoting tropical limnology is highly essential. In this regard, ASEAN Talks webinar in inland water ecosystem is the forum that is projected to bridge multi-sectoral parties and communities, communities from different backgrounds to share scientific knowledge and experience and support sustainable management in the field of tropical limnology. This event is, gonna, is organized by Research Center for Limnology, LIPI, in collaboration with ASEAN, Southeast ASEAN Limnological Network, CILNET, and the Indonesian Society of Limnology. 
the joint committees, uh, the reflection of our effort in the management of the tropical inland waters and its related system. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, as one of the organizing institution of this ASEAN Talks webinar in inland water, Please check chains on various inland waters. To this date, the research center for limnology, LIPI, has played an important role in supporting and encouraging aquatic research activities, notably in the area of Indonesian lakes, who has, uh, whose number amounts to 5,718 lakes, according to our inventory. The research center for limnology, LIPI, also offer collaboration and knowledge exchange to support the sustainable management of global inland water resource. As recognition of our global endeavor, the Research Center for Illuminology LIPI has been selected the, as the host of the Secretary of SILNET, an organization which aims to contribute toward overcoming current and important issues of national, regional, and global interest such as water quality degradation, climate change adaptation, biodiversity, and disaster risk reduction. The ASEAN Talks webinar in inland water ecosystem is a perfect momentum for the Research Center for Limnology LIPI to contribute toward protect, protecting the inland water ecosystem as world heritage. We believe that this forum is an excellent platform for us to exchange scientific dialogues and policies, understand the urgency of sustained inland water ecosystem, and to recognize the importance of establishing baseline data and managing the sustainability of lakes, river, reservoir, and wetland in the Asian region. We would like to notify you that this forum is part of the preparation for the next second international conference on tropical limnology, which will be held on November 18 to 20, 2020. Please also be informed that the conference, is, the conference will be held periodic periodically with the alternating mm. organizers. Maybe next time in Philippines or Malaysia or uh, Laos, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf the Research Center of Polymnology, LIPI. I would like to express our earnest gratitude to the speaker, all speakers, Prof. Juan Masna, Juan Omar from Malaysia, Ms. Adelina Santos Borja from the Philippines, Dr. Hamla from Laos, from Prof. Masahira, Masaisa Nakamura from Japan, and Dr. Lukis Behi from Indonesia, for their willingness to share their valuable knowledge and experience in this forum. I also would like to express our, our gra gratitude to the ASEAN Secretariat, Dr. Michel Xu, the focal point of the Subcommittee on Marine Science and Technology of ASEAN, Dr. Augi Sahai Latua, and the Vice Chairperson of ILEC, Professor Nakamura, for taking the time in the middle of their busy schedule to participate in this forum. Lastly, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the committees for their hard work to prepare this conference, this webinar, I mean. As closing statement, I would like to express my hope that through this event, we can have interesting discussion and build communication between each of us, in particular, to get support and to increase partnership among scientists, policymakers, and academics for a better sustainable inland water resource management. Dengan mengucapkan bismillah, with saying bismillah, with this mark, uh, I declare this ASEAN Talk webinar is open. Thank you very much for ten attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you very much, Dr. Fauzan Ali, for your warm welcome and opening remarks today. Now we have a photo sessions. So we are going to take two shots. First shot is for all the presenter. And then the second shot, the presenter and the organizing committee all together. So please, uh, the host and co-host could help with the preparation and also the photo shot. Ms. Intapong and uh, Kiyoko Sang, can you open your video? Ms. Intapong? Ms. Intapong? Ms. Intapong? Would you like to open the video? Yes. Uh, Miss Intafong? <laughs> Miss Intafong. <laughs> okay, we will wait for Miss Intafong for a while. Miss Intafong? Ah. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. And then with, okay. okay. Once more. All the committee. Please open the video of the committee. Uh, okay, ready? For the committee, please open the video. We're going to take a short. Okay. Okay, Pak Topik, Dewi, Yovita. Uh, yeah, Miss Dewi and Miss Yovita. Okay, okay. Okay, I think there are, there is a problem with uh, the camera of Miss Yovita. Okay. Miss? Huh? Yeah. Not yet. Can we start? Uh, I think there are a problem with Miss Dewi and with Miss Yovita, so we're going to take a uh, photo shot without them. Okay. Maybe uh, the co host can help to count. Up. One. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Finish. Thank you. Finish. Thank you. Before we get started with the presentation for from our presenters today, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel or the YouTube chat box. And don't forget to mention your name, country, and to which panel is your question for, and also your questions. As I mentioned before, this webinar is also conducted by SILNET, so there are some documented agenda what CINET have done with. And ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this short video of CINET.
Okay. Distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, without any longer, now we begin to the main event of this webinar, which is a presentation session from our expert, our speakers today with different topic related to the theme. So if you have any question during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel or the YouTube chat. And don't forget to mention your name, your country, to which panel is your question for, and also the questions. And now, I would like to invite Dr. Luki Subahi for the first presenter. Let me give you a brief about him. Dr. Luki Subahi is a senior researcher in the Research Center for Limnology, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. His expertise is hydroclimatology and ecological processes, freshwater environment and water quality. He is also the Secretary General of SILNET and during 2019 to 2024, he working with some projects collaboration, for example, with Chonam University, South Korea, USM Malaysia, and also Kyoto University, Japan. And today he's gonna to talk about the introduction of SILNET ASEAN Cost 77 meeting report and future future potential collaboration. Okay, without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Lucas Subahi for our first presenter. Please unmute. Okay, thank you, Hello, moderator. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please let me share my presentation. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay. That's still loading. <clears throat> okay. 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 Thank you. So uh, today uh, I would like to present about uh, introduction of CNN and future potential collaboration as a topic from a committee uh, which uh, to me to present uh, our, webinar, our webinar ASEAN talks. Uh, okay, let me uh, first to introduce uh, our institute, uh, my office in uh, Indonesia and uh, Research Center for Limnology. Uh, as you know that uh, our research is located in uh, Bogor, near Jakarta. And uh, we are uh, the National Research Center in Indonesia, which is focusing on Indian water, river, lakes, wetland ponds, and so forth. That involve multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary studies, uh, but physical, chemical, geological, biological, and so on. And also the function of our institute that uh, we have uh, we has a partner as a government to provide the reference for policy making on Indian water and also providing technical guidelines, guideline, planning and evaluation on Indian water research. As far as uh, I know that we also have some networking in the local and uh, in the national and international uh, networking. We hear some uh, bilateral and multilateral networking in uh, Japan, Korea, uh, also from uh, local government and also USM here. So, I mean, that uh, based on this uh, networking, uh, I hope that this also we can more broader uh, with uh, SILNET combined with uh, ASEAN in uh, regions so we can more, uh, uh, what is, uh, what's the, the, our research in the ASEAN region. And uh, as we know that the water resources problem, uh, we can uh, see that some uh, item in the world problem that requires is change of land use and land cover, degradation of forest land, water pollution and environment qualities, decrease in water resources availability, the lake basin management challenge, and also eutrophication and street to lake water resource degradation. So uh, this is a general problem in, uh, in the water. In, uh, we see in the pictures, so this is some example, uh, degradation of forest land and soil erosion. And this is uh, some uh, agriculture also uh, activities uh, influence to the hydrological processes in the, uh, to the river and so on. 
and also uh, in the lake, we know that some aquaculture uh, activities and also the domestic activities and uh, sedimentation, siltation, and water hazard problem also occur in our uh, lakes in Indonesia. And also uh, algal bloom, like uh, in the year. So now um, I want you to try to uh, inventories of common lakes in Indonesia. So now we uh, have final and uh, step, next step we, we, we will uh, publish some uh, publication as our director said in the welcome email also. We have uh, identified about five five uh, thousand uh, lakes in Indonesia and total area about five uh, five eighty hundred hectare. And this is a uh, distribution some uh, our lake in Indonesia. In, uh, we have five uh, main lane, uh, main island and Sumatra, Kalimantan, Java, Sulawesi, and Papua. And uh, regarding to the national program, uh, I think this is maybe from uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry. We has we, have, we should also follow the program from uh, government, our government, like the National 15 Priority Lakes Program. Uh, this is resulted by uh, Indian Lake National Conference in Bali. So we, 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 we know that how to identify uh, criteria for this uh, 15 priority lakes such as uh, lake damage, uh, level of sedimentation, pollution, education, also lake utilization, like for hydropower plan, agriculture, fisheries, uh, and water, and also uh, local governments and society commitment to wisely managed lakes, like master plan, local regulation, and or managing committee. And strategy lake, of course, is uh, also important, important uh, like capturing strategy function of national interest, and by diversity, including endemic fish species, uh, birds, and vegetation, and also carbon agency that challenge again global climate change. And let's uh, talking about the to the ASEAN after the, we are our country. So uh, in the reality, we know that uh, ASEAN countries consist of uh, ten countries uh, until now: Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Brunei Darussalam, Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, PDR, Thailand, and Myanmar. And also a generally developed country that uh, the environment the dynamical change potential, and that cover about uh, 650 million population. So it's almost big uh, population here. And we have a tropical rainforest ecoregion, and uh, 1,000 millimeter per year of precipitation. About 3,000 millimeter are recorded in West Sumatra and Sumatra Kalimantan, and also average precipitation. Uh, 2,500 millimeter in Malaysia and also in Thailand, 1,500 millimeter. So this is uh, the background or the condition of the uh, this, uh, this region. And uh, about the Indian water, we have ASEAN has uh, lakes, uh, the big lakes like Tonglesap Lake in Cambodia, like Matanos in uh, Sulawesi, Lake Toba in Sumatra, uh, Asik Chini in Pahang, Malaysia, in the lake in Myanmar, also some, and extra maybe so many, uh, also lakes. And now, uh, uh, sample for reservoir, we have Tasik Temangor and Tasik Temangor in Malaysia. We have also Jati Buhur in uh, Java Indonesia, and also Pangman uh, Sasudirman and Malaysia in Central Java Indonesia. And uh, river, of course, we have so many river, and the, maybe the famous is Mekong River, uh, about 400, uh, 4,100 kilometer. In, in, uh, included or uh, cover some countries like China, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And also in Kalimantan, we have Kapuas uh, River, about 1,000 kilometers. And in Malaysia, we have uh, Perak River, 400 kilometers. So this is a description of the condition and uh, reach of our uh, biodiversity and unique of our inland water in uh, ASEAN countries. And here I, I try to look the case by case uh, in our uh, research sample in here is in uh, Laga Menja. We, we, Laga is a lake, like a small lake, uh, Lake Menja in Central Java. Uh, this is a uh, volcanic lake, but some hydropower plant here uh, also uh, conducted here and some tourism and also uh, agriculture and also uh, fish culture, fish culture also in here. So 
I think uh, this is a small representative uh, the problem of uh, generally in uh, our research for problem in uh, especially in Indonesia because we have a uh, uh, main function as uh, low power but another activities like uh, fisheries or tourism or agriculture and so on also uh, uh, conduct by uh, societies surrounding uh, the, in the that life so in here we have to uh, uh, analysis of current capacity and uh, trying to donation for the best management. So all of all of the activities can be can be run, but not uh, disturb to the main function as example in Telaga Manjang as a, a main function as a hydro power uh, activities. And uh, second, uh, this uh, another uh, different case also. This in Rota Island, you know, this uh, south part of Indonesia, the south part, and but uh, actually the most south part of Indonesia is uh, Indana Island, uh, the south part from uh, Rota Island. It's, it's very small. So uh, in there, uh, I saw some uh, very unique uh, condition that, like uh, like Hoima uh, Sapoka, which is the largest lake, uh, but this is a water lake, and we found also a snake. Uh, snake lake turtle. This is a very unique uh, and very uh, limited amount, and I think that now, so we we, we should uh, to, con to protect that uh, species. And in the lake uh, Oiduli, this is the white like snow, but it's not snow. This is because our tropics are our tropical region. This is uh, south like south. So uh, also in the lake Merah, we in Dana Island in the, south, the most south. Lake. Is we have two lakes, uh, Lake Mera and Lake Tupi. This is Lake Mera. Also, this is also water. If uh, this is some uh, data, I can show you that the salinity is almost uh, almost forty. So, but also in the other location, more than forty, we, we found that salinity. So this is very unique uh, characteristic for uh, our inland water. And this is uh, some uh, part of our project in integration system development through a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach for mapping natural resources and the environment, case study in the water at water island. So at the present, we, we just want to map uh, how the condition in general in the water island, but maybe next uh, step we should, uh, and we need to more uh, investigate to analyze more uh, detail, the, especially in the South water in the South uh, Island. And uh, next, this is uh, our also next our uh, research in the Kapuas upstream water set and Lake Sentaru. Uh, this is in West Sumatra. <clears throat> in here, we we found some uh, part plain lakes, uh, very, very uh, dynamic of fluctuation here, uh, thing one wet and thing one dry. And when the dry season, no water like uh, mainland, so we can uh, pass the lake by motorcycle even. And uh, here uh, also we have some uh, super red arwana, maybe this very famous uh, fish in there, and, and also uh, expensive. We, we should also uh, manage to protect how this uh, kind of this uh, fish. And uh, we. Uh, in this project, we, we try to uh, how to flatten ecosystem and their connectivity connectivity with people. And here we, we collaborate with with, with uh, CR European University and also uh, Taman Nasional Bukit Kemendana Staru or National Park uh, Staru. And we try to uh, analyze how connectivity uh, could work between uh, mainstream or main river, Foxbow Lake, and also our forest flooded or wetland so we, we, we want to know what the interaction uh, among there because here in the Kapua, so we found some so many uh, oxbow lake and also some permanent and non-permanent uh, lake i mean that in dry season they are only main lane but in the wet season they become like uh, oxbow lake and so on this is also interesting and uh, so i think this is also we uh, can similar with uh, our recent in Sentarum uh, uh, Lake. Uh, maybe my colleagues from Laos, uh, Professor Kamla or Ms. Intapong, maybe can we can explain more detail, maybe. But 
this uh, this is uh, I get I get this information from my colleague uh, Kamla because uh, now we try to uh, make some uh, proposal uh, to ASEAN uh, for a project in Laos, and I think the the see some this the see some content. I think this is very interesting also because this not only Ramchar convention but this also some uh, dynamical uh, change like uh, but the next like so uh, dry and wet season is a very extreme difference and also found some uh, oxbow rate here yeah. so uh, in uh, my uh, I, my idea that maybe it is listed in here we could we could we could conduct some uh, water management like quality uh, flood control or also biodiversity conservation infrastructure space control and etc uh, later i i uh, invite our of you especially from laos and also my colleagues in asean countries we can uh, mix together how to uh, uh, work in uh, this uh, side of basin and uh, this uh philippine because uh, i have been there maybe um, my colleague, uh, Ms. Adelina, maybe 2015, I, I forget. I, I just interesting that in that time, I, I saw that some society participation is very uh, big to uh, management in example in Lake Pandu. So this is a good uh, example, good sample maybe, to uh, how to involve the society, how to involve the stakeholder uh, surround the lake uh, to uh, protect and to it is to, yes to manage for the the best uh, uh, that like uh, still good quality and good uh, quantity. And uh, next we here here is our uh, our so collaboration with USN between uh, Social Center for Immunology and uh, School of Biological Science School of Biological Science uh, USN. Uh, here we try to compare this is. Cascade Reservoir, that the left side is uh, Malaysia from Perak River, Perak River, from Temengor to Bersia, Kenering, and also Cenderung Lake, at Cenderung Reservoir. And the other side in uh, Indonesia example is our Saguling, Cirata, Jatiku. So I think it is also some uh, potential to how to uh, collaborate here, how, how to identify the different and current community in uh, both of these uh, reservoirs. I think this is of course, uh, different problem and different condition, but you can see how the uh, analysis and the management of this uh, cascade is for. And this is uh, some activities uh, as long as uh, collaborating with USM in Pasir Temungo, Pasir Temungo, and uh, Pasir Bukit We survey some uh, water quality, bathymetry, aquatic plan, and so on. So until now, we still uh, continue the, our collaboration. So I, I mean that maybe next we also can be uh, replicable, replicate these uh, activities, maybe with uh, Myanmar, Thailand, or uh, Philippines also. We, we can uh, share these uh, activities together. And uh, yes, this collaboration between uh, SLDP and also uh, School of Medicine. Also, of, now uh, I try to uh, Talk about the SILNET that uh, this uh, new organization. So we know that the uh, uniqueness of the our uh, our field that in the ASEAN or tropical region is water quality and tropical system is needed to be investigated. And Sorry, Dr. Lucky. Okay. You have less than five minutes. Okay, thank you. Water pollutant and cost measure for tropic and tropical region has unique characteristics. So this is some uh, reference uh, how to uh, the characteristics. Uh, diversity and high economic potential of the tropical in water should give huge advantages for ASEAN society and contribute to the world environment. And this is some historical moment this trigger to uh, build some CNET from 2013 in the first seminar national MRI and also uh, proposal from USM support this uh, CNET. Here is the rundown, uh, yes, this uh, milestone from 2016 until 2020. Skip here, and the vision and mission. Uh, we, we can uh, see on our website also about uh, vision mission, but maybe vision is to be host uh, their own region in the sign of tropical, tropical development. 
And the benefit, I will, uh, I hope that plant some power plant, doing this system exchange and we do now, we can uh, do it in the same way. And this is some organization, uh, chairperson is Ms. Adelina and I'm also an MS and the secretary. And this is some activities, um, we, we can see that this is like a knowledge visit by uh, Philippines and Malaysia. And also this is uh, Indonesia and Malaysia in Temengo. And the last, uh, we have also a joint publication, which is a good, I think it's a good sample for next collaboration. And some program, maybe we uh, now we collaborate with international organization like ASEAN, SAMSA, INEC, uh, DIPA, and ICT, and so on. Maybe we will have to continue with it. And uh, also we have international power plant series, like uh, the initial in the Malaysia ice bed 2018, and 2019 we have Propino 1, uh, first, and Second to talk to you know, uh, in November 2020 for an event. So please join in here. And some presenters of member, I think we have also some uh, 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 large networking, so we can uh, uh, take benefit from this uh, uh, networking for our collaboration. And the secret is uh, in our research center for immunity. And this website you can see more detail in our website. And yes, this is uh, maybe the point that uh, toward partnership, subcommittee on medicine and technology, on chat and also the ASEAN Energy Network. So I want to thanks to Dr. Aufi and Dr. Dirham, Dr. Rahan, who invite me and Dr. Uh, Dr. Fauzan and we aim to uh, as participation in the uh, ASEAN COSTI and uh, meeting in uh, Singapore. And that time, uh, maybe this the red square is the meeting also note that our PDR and USA agreed to develop proposal targeting the management of first quarter ecosystem. So now we try to make uh, prepare that uh, kind of uh, proposal to, to submit to the ASEAN committee. And this um, uh, activities in picture, our meeting in the Singapore. Yes, and also some uh, maybe some uh, idea to collaboration between Senate and SAMSAT about like this uh, coastal management issue or some. Uh, Genesis on climate change adaptation and mitigation, particularly the interaction between inland and marine ecosystem. And how to contribute, this is some to develop the database. I think it's important also to identify and investigate, investigate several in the water at ASEAN countries, or to propose the training and workshop, and to participate actively in every scientific event and to disseminate the result of inland water research. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Luki, for your excellent uh -huh. presentation. Uh, some important information we got from your presentation, I think. And yeah, Indonesia has experiences with some issues concerning to land use, uh, land cover chain, sedimentation, algae bloom in many lakes, and massive kill feeds, and also water pollution, and some degradation in the forest also. Uh, in another aspect, Dr. Luki share about SILNET. Uh, this is a very good time for the audience to know more about SILNET. However, Dr. Luki has presented the establishment and also the objective of SILNET. He also said about a possible partnership and collaboration in the future regarding the better management for sustainable tropical inland water ecosystem. Now, everyone, let's continue with our second presenter. We have Ms. Adelina Santos Borja. So let me give a brief about her. She's the vice chairperson of the scientific committee of ILEC, and she's also the chairperson of SILNET. And her expertise in lake basin management, limnology, and also stakeholders in judgment. Recently, she has some concluded uh, projects. First, biodiversity-driven nutrient cycling and socio-ecological system, a five-year project led by the Research Institute for Humanity and Nature Japan, in collaboration with Laguna Lake Development Authority, the University of Santo Tomas, and the University of Philippines. And the second project, a carrying capacity assessment of Laguna Dibe for aquaculture in aid of new policy on aquaculture operation in the lake. 
she has current interest in assessment of the viability of floating solar farm in Laguna de Bay and general water quality guidelines for tropical lakes in the ASEAN region. So today, Ms. Adelina will present about Lake Basin Management Initiative in Laguna de Bay and their replicability in the ASEAN region. And I welcome Ms. Adelina for your presentation. Yeah, um, good morning from the Philippines and uh, mabuhay to my uh, fellow uh, Filipinos who are participating in this uh, seminar or in this webinar. Okay, um, yes, it is a very good opportunity for uh, us in the Philippines and the particularly uh, together with the Laguna De uh, Lake Development Authority to present to you some of the lake basin management initiatives in Laguna de Bay and hopefully it can be replicated in the ASEAN region. So just a brief information about Laguna de Bay or Laguna Lake. It is uh, the largest lake in the Philippines, strategically uh, located in the heart of Metro Manila and uh, two major provinces in the Philippines. It has a very big watershed area composed of uh, around 61 towns and cities and 188 barangays, or we call it a kampong or villages. There are 24 major tributary rivers that drain into the lake, and there is only one outlet, the Pasig River, which drains to Manila Bay. So periodically uh, there is salt water intrusion in the lake. So we can say that this is strictly not a freshwater lake. Also, it is a very shallow and the basin population is composed of 16 million people. By the way, uh, I will not go very much into the finer details because the presentations will be shared to all the participants. In terms of water quality qual cl classification, it is a class C water which means that the intended and beneficial use is for fishery and for other uh, compatible uses. The lake is a multiple use resource, but at present, the uh, major use of the lake is uh, for fishery. And uh, with all these uh, environmental goods and services and the demand uh, for, from the benefits that they can get from the lake, uh, you can say that Laguna de Bay is an extremely stressed lake the pictures speak louder than words, the threats and the impacts, in fact, were already uh, mentioned by Dr. Fauzan Ali and uh, Dr. Luki Subehi. So uh, this is a common problem in the ASEAN region. And of course, the visible manifestation is eutrophication, and this is evident in algal blooms, infestation of uh, water hyacinth and uh, fish kill. There is a specific government agency that was created by a special law, the Republic Act 4850, and this is the Laguna Lake Development Authority with a major mandate to protect and develop the Laguna de Bay region with due regard to the environment. The uh, LLDA has been in operation for more than 50 years. So through, the, through those years, it has accumulated a lot of lessons, a lot of experiences, uh, some success, some failures, and um, from these I will choose uh, three uh, major initiatives that I can share with you because they have been uh, proven to be uh, very effective. So first is the environmental user fee system which uh, addresses the pollution coming from point sources like the industries. Next is the fishery zoning and management plan. This is for aquaculture and management. And lastly, it's uh, stakeholder participation in a micro watershed level. So first, let's uh, go with the environmental user fee system. It is a um, market-based instrument that applies the polluters pay principle. And this is a fee that is paid for discharging wastewater into the environment. And take note, this is exclusive of penalties for violation of pollution control law. 
you can see in the spot map the distribution of different establishments, different industries, business around the Laguna de Bay uh, basin. And uh, most of these are concentrated in Manila, Metro Manila, and slowly it's spreading in the other provinces. So how do we determine the environmental user fee? This is an example using a BOD5 or the biochemical oxygen demand as the regulatory parameter. The effluent standard for BOD is 50 milligrams per liter. So the EUF is composed of a fixed fee and then the variable fee and the total annual BOD load. So the essence of this formula is for industries to pay a higher fixed fee if the volume of water discharged to the environment is higher. And second, the variable fee. So you pay a minimum amount of five pesos per kilogram of BOD if it is within the effluent standard and you pay six times more when the effluent standard is exceeded. So a lot of people are saying, oh, that EUF is just a license to pollute. But is it really a license to pollute? The answer is a big no. Why? Because aside from paying the EUF, the LLDA exercises its quasi-judicial function. So uh, issuance of notice of violation is uh, being done for, uh, of course, the violators. There are penalties for non-compliance. Uh, there is a issuance of cease and desist order, so a business can stop uh, operating. They cannot use their wastewater because it, uh, I mean the water, and uh, they cannot discharge wastewater because it's uh, closed by the LLDA, and a lawsuit can be filed against the violator. Thus, a polluting establishment must pay the EUF and confront pollution cases. The... Um, Variable fee that is uh, being collected by the um, LLDA is being uh, used, allocated for environmental projects, such as those implemented by the river councils and the uh, water management, uh, watershed management council. The EUF has been proven to be very effective because in the first 10 years of implementation, there was already a 58% reduction in the BOD. And now more industries are covered by the EUF and uh, uh, very encouraging results are, uh, are, are being uh, received. So because of the success of the EUF, which, is, which started as a pilot project in uh, Laguna de Bay Basin, in 2002, the uh, Department of Environment and Natural Resources has implemented the EUF on a national scale. Next is let's go to aquaculture. A lot of our lakes are being used for aquaculture. And I would like to share a bit about the history of aquaculture in Laguna Lake. It uh, started as a pilot project in uh, 1968, to be exact. And uh, the initial area is 38 hectares. The essence of this one is it should be based on the availability of natural food in the lake. So it's believed that there will be no ecological uh, imbalance. And the high economic return for fishermen is actually one of the major objectives of this uh, pilot project. Now, this has become very um, attractive because of the increase in uh, fish yield uh, through aquaculture. So from an area of 5,000 hectares in 1973, it increased to 35,000 hectares in 1983, which covers about 40% of the total surface area of the lake. So the intention to uh, assist or improve the livelihood of fishermen was really sort of not met because the big business men took over because this aquaculture venture is capital intensive. And during that time that it was introduced, there are no existing financial support or lending mechanism for fishermen. So as a result, uh, there were ecological problems. There was conflict between the traditional fishermen and owners of the fishermen. The access to the lake is, uh, has become a big problem for the fishermen. So what was the in intervention done by the, by the Laguna Lake Development Authority? Where is a fishery zoning and management plan? 
By the way, I was with the Laguna Lake Development Authority for more than four decades, and I just uh, recently retired last February. So sometimes I still feel that I'm uh, very much a part of the LLBA. So what are the basic features of um, the zone map? It specifies the allowable area for aquaculture based on the lake's carrying capacity. It delineates the fish pen zones, the fish cage zones, the navigational lanes, access lanes, the distance from the shoreline. Also, it sets the limit on the size of a fish pen or fish cage based on the type of ownership. It also delineates the area for uh, fish sanctuaries and the use of artificial or commercial feed is not allowed. So uh, this is a, an image of the 1996 zone map. Uh, these are the layouts of the fish pen zones and the fish cage zones. This is 2003 zone map. You can see some changes here. Uh, the summary will come later. And this is a 2019 zone map. This is a, a very, very new. And uh, it also has sort of a uh, slightly different configuration from the 2003 zone map. So this zone map is actually a living uh, program of uh, LLDA. You can see that from 1983 to 2019, there is a corresponding decrease in the total area allocated for aquaculture based on the lake's carrying capacity. And one highlight of the, the 2019 zone map is that there are more areas allocated for fish cages. Why? Because in our consultations with the fishermen, they inform us that they can now operate their own fish cage because these are relatively smaller than fish pens. And also there was a directive from President Duterte that we should give priority entitlement to fishermen. So the fish pen uh, is only uh, 3,680 hectares. Also in, times, in terms of the size, for example, for a fish pen, it used to be 100 hectares per corporation, but now it is only 20 hectares per our corporation. The fish pen feed that is being collected by the LLDA is shared with the different local government units. This is in the essence of partnership, collaboration, and support for environmental projects. So only 40% is being retained by the uh, LLDA. 5% is set aside as a project development fund, which can also be accessed by the stakeholders. 20% is for local government units. These are the lakeshore towns and cities where there are fish pens or fish cages off their shore. 5% is for other lakeshore towns and cities without any fish pens off their shore. 5% goes to the barangay or the villages. And 5% goes to the provincial government. Third is the stakeholders' participation. You know, stakeholders' participation is actually a very big word, but how can we make it more meaningful and more inclusive? I put a highlight on the barangays and in the resource user communities, the community representatives. And though with our uh, work with the communities in the region, it's really proven that the pers their participation of the small and far off barangays is very, very essential. So I would like to share with you our, uh, uh, it started as a project in Santa Rosa subwatershed. In that subwatershed, there are four local government units. Uh, there are three cities, uh, Binyan, Santa Rosa, and Cabuya, which is uh, in the downstream portion. And in the upstream portion is a town at Itzilang, and uh, still, uh, the main source of revenue is from agricultural activities. So in each of the sub-watershed, the LLDA has organized and are still organizing the Watershed Management Council. So it is a multi-sectoral group. And you'll see the composition, the mayor and other officials, uh, representatives from the academe, water supply sector, industries, religious groups, youth, NGO, sectoral organizations, but in all of this, there, we found that, that there are very few people from the villages who are participating in this kind of uh, endeavor. And so uh, let me point out to the town of Silang, it's the upstream community. And there, there is a spring and a clean river called Malindig River. You know, now it's very seldom, you, it, 
like me, I'm always excited to see a spring and river in the Laguna de Bay region because mostly most of the rivers are already in a very critical state in terms of their uh, water quality. So in Silang, there is a barangay, a village called Carmen. And our enabling environment in uh, pursuing this uh, village uh, participation is through a project called the Biodiversity Driven Nutrient Cycling and Human Wellbeing in Social Ecological System funded by the Japanese government. And uh, this is done in collaboration among the Japanese experts, LLDA, the University of Santo Tomas, and the University of the Philippines. So we started our work in 2015. And you know, uh, this, uh, this was our first intact interaction with the women. And uh, you know, they're just engaged in uh, uh, helping the, the barangay captain or the head of the village. Uh, they uh, are involved in uh, cleanliness campaigns. Uh, they are uh, involved in village festivals, fundraising, and a very small scale local tourism in the Malindig River and Malindig Spring. And they have very, very minimal knowledge and awareness on the ecology of their river and the, their spring. And they take so much pride with their river and the spring. So through the years, so these are like three years in the making, we conducted series of meetings and workshops, capacitating the women. Uh, of course, environmental awareness is always part of the process. We pointed out to them the need to have an organization, the need to be uh, strong. And this was also an opportunity for uh, technical people, for scientists, to use simple language in explaining technical terms. So instead of saying that, for example, the volume of water that flows through Malindig, Malindig River is 300 cubic meters per day, we can just say, oh, the volume of water that passed through your river is like uh, 3,000 pails or 3,000 buckets of water. And uh, it's, it's very encouraging that the women organized themselves and adopted the name S. Carmen. This is in Tagalog. It's, the meaning is very long, so I will not uh, belabor you on the meaning. So this is also a first that we did in the village level, citizen science. We have an expert on macro zooabentos from the University of the Philippines that gave the training and lecture on macro zooabentos. So they were taught on how to collect these uh, organisms. And you know the women were very excited that when they pick up the stone and turn it upside down, they realized they saw that there are many living organisms. So that excitement sort of encouraged us to really uh, work more in this field. So they were even uh, trained on how to sort and how to identify these macrozoventos using uh, these uh, tarpaulin, these pictures. And uh, I was there in one of the training of the sessions, and I was so glad to hear the excitement of these women. And they have pride whenever they find uh, these clean water uh, indicators in their river. So they take it upon themselves as their pride. Ah, that we have, we still have a clean river. So since they're already organized we they were invited to attend the annual stakeholders assembly of the santa rosa watershed management council and this was actually their first to participate in such big event they were able to air their concerns in their village as simple as non-collection of garbage and so immediately the following week the local government uh, acted immediately and uh, now it's a regular collection of the garbage and uh, the escarmen has become an active member of the Watershed Management Council. So a proof of their empowerment uh, was actually shown in January 2019. They were very surprised that the, the spring and the river was damaged by an ongoing project, and this is a government project. So before they said, oh, we will just be quiet because it's the government. But now they reported the incident to the LLDA and uh, there were in inspections conducted and a dialogue was held with the construction company and corrective measures were done. I just checked and they said, yes, uh, the problem has already been solved. So um, this is uh, uh, my last slide showing what I want to emphasize here that 
in the remote villages in far-flung areas, environmental champions can emerge. We just have to uh, assist them so that they will build confidence among themselves, provide them uh, some knowledge so that they will be empowered. So this was in March 2019 when the leader of the women's group was invited to present in a, in a seminar in Japan to present their organization and the activities that they have been doing in Malindig River and also in Malindig Spring. Now, because of the success of this uh, uh, project, it will now become a program and the LLDA will duplicate the strategies in Barangay Carmen to other far-flung and small barangays in the Laguna de Bay region. So with this, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, thank you very much for uh, participating and uh, for your interest in Laguna de Bay. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Ms. Adelina, for your excellent presentation. I'm sure that uh, many audience here will get insight and some inspiration for your experience in the group management of Laguna Lake Bay to overcome the main problems there. Um, there are some important points that can be highlighted from your presentation, because this is, I think, a good example for lake management. First, uh, Philippines had a strategy by applied fishery zoning and management plan based on the lake carrying capacity. And then uh, LLD, LLDA also has a regulation about uh, environmental user-free system for point source of pollution. Uh, they use uh, BUD5 as the standard to count the fee penalty in water quality management and environment to make sure that the BUD concentration is under control. And perhaps this is maybe replicate in other ASEAN countries. And this is very essential information, I think. And also they, has, uh, they have a stakeholder participation with citizen science uh, approach in Barangay. So they encourage women to be more aware of their environment. And they also apply science-based improvement in the way to protect a uh, river by training using zoobentic to understand the current condition of water quality. And maybe our audience may have a question about that. If you have any question during this presentation, I can really remind you again, please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel or YouTube chat. Don't forget to mention your name, country, to which panel is your question for, and also the questions. So let us continue, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen. Our third presenter is Professor Dr. Wan Masna Wan Omar. So let me give a brief about her. She is a professor in the School of Biological Science, University of Science Malaysia, USM. She also the treasurer of SILNET and her expertise is aquatic ecology and conservation, algae ecology and biotechnology. And recently she has some ongoing project. Uh, during 2019 to 2023, the first project, Unfailing Community Attributed and Ecophysiological Adaptation of Aerophytic Oxypototrop is an ecotope of Nayeh Cave Complex a hierarchical framework of algal indices and whole genome framework approaches. And the second project, Bukit Merah Reservoir, a sentinel of environmental stressor, paleolimnological approach to invert past chains archive in lake sediment. Prof. Wan today going to talk about issues and challenges in managing water resources in Malaysia and role of Malaysian scientists toward ASEAN inland water research. Prof. Wan, you are most welcome to present your topic. Thank you, Iim. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, the, the organizers, particularly Dr. Luki, for initiating uh, this um, virtual discussion and also for Iim. I hope we, uh, we will meet again in Malaysia and also uh, for other committee members for their uh, hard work. 
um, and for inviting me to give some insights into Malaysian water resource issues and challenges and our efforts in managing water resources for current and future generations. Okay, uh, my apology for the technical delay. Uh, um, this 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 topic was given by uh, Dr. Luki and also Dr. Fauzan. Um, so the topic given to me is on the issues and challenges in managing water resources uh, in Malaysia and rules of Malaysian um, uh, scientists towards as an inland water research. So actually, this is quite a big uh, topic for me to be uh, to to discuss and present uh, during this short period. But, but I will I will try uh, my best. Okay, please bear uh, with me. First of all, I would like to uh, talk about problems and issues related to water uh, resources uh, in Malaysia. I think similar to other countries like uh, being presented by Ms. Adelina, in Malaysia we have water shortage, although we are blessed with huge water supply, especially during uh, wet season. But during dry season, water supply uh, will be reduced. Yeah, um, this photo shows what, it, what, is, uh, what happened during uh, dry season in Muda Dam. And also sometimes pollution occur in the uh, uh, at, at the source that pollute that pollute the water, and some sometimes the um, uh, treatment plants have to be shut down. So when this happen, so the local people will be um, we, we will be affected the most. So this photo shows the what happened during water source shortage in Selangor in 2019. So uh, people have to queue up to get their supply of clean water. So it is very unfortunate. Yeah? And we also have flood issues. Actually, flood events occur regularly during uh, wet season, especially uh, flash flood. But these two photos uh, show the quite big flood e event occurred in 2014 in Kelantan. Okay, and also in Penang in 2016. So this occurs uh, not only because of the uh, huge uh, uh, rainwater, but also because of the human activities at the catchment area. So uh, and, uh, our ecosystem has less capacity to with water. So, so, uh, so this uh, flood still occur in, uh, uh, in Malaysia. And polluted waters, okay? Water ecosystems are polluted by point and non-point source of organic and inorganic pollutants by various human activities. Some of Malaysian rivers are categorized as heavily polluted. And these photos show a quite recent uh, unfortunate events that occurred in King Kim River located in Johor at the southern part of the peninsula Malaysia, where industrial waste were drummed straight away into the river. So uh, people have to be evacuated and many people have to be uh, hospitalized. River sedimentation because of the deforestation. So deforestation due to our eagerness to develop more plantation areas for urbanization and also, and also for logging activities, if, uh, whether legal or illegal. So heavy deforestation will increase the sedimentation of river and reduce the water sources. Coastal erosion also occur in, uh, in Malaysia and this photo shows the uh, coastal erosion at Terengganu Beach. Resource depletion. Resource depletion in terms of the water source itself, but other resources, for example, fisheries and other services. So when pollution occur, when the sedimentation occur, so 
the ecosystem itself cannot play its role, so it will deplete the resources overall. So we have uh, an issue on the non-revenue water losses. So non-revenue, I, I think already uh, I already knew that is the difference between the quantity of water that leaves treatment plants and the quantity of water that actually reach, reach the consumers. So losses, I think in Malaysia and also other country can be real through leakage, sometimes also referred to as physical losses or apparent losses, for example, through theft or metering inaccuracies. So average non-revenue uh, water in Malaysia remains higher than the global average despite our efforts to rectify the problems. Um, Water production in Malaysia has increased over the years and accessibility has become nearly universal with 95% of the population receiving clean water. But water demand in Malaysia increased twofold every two decades. Hence, the sustainability of water resources is a major issue in Malaysia. So the following slides will show uh, the contributing factors that uh, bring towards water resources related issues uh, in Malaysia. So I think this happened globally. So uh, rapid changes in land, land activities due to pollution growth, urbanization and deforestation, climate change will degrade the water resource. And policy, the change in government policy increased the complexity of uh, managing water resources. And low water tariffs in Malaysia. In Malaysia, water tariff is set by the state government and varies among the states, though the rate remains among the lowest worldwide for decades. So when the cheap tariff, uh, uh, people, consumers, uh, like the low water tariffs, but low uh, water tariff and cheap tariff can be counterproductive as it may encourage people to waste water uh, and to do unsustainable usage. Um, the following um, uh, slide will show the challenges in water risk man management in Malaysia. So there are a few challenges, institutional issues, financial instruments, low, particip uh, low participation from stakeholders, especially NGOs and locals. So after uh, I seen the uh, Miss Lenny um, presentation, we have to, Malaysia have to adopt LDD uh, a, uh, approach to involve um, local people for, uh, for, for our efforts to manage uh, water resources. Yeah? And like lack of water harvesting techniques from other sources, lack of pollution control and regu regulatory instruments to control the water quality, quantity uh, and water services, uh, and politics involvement in decision-making processes and also le uh, legal and, and also policy issues. So uh, due to the uh, time constraint given for each speaker, I just um, touch uh, each of these uh, challenges on the surface only. Yeah? So um, although there are many constraints in managing water resources, but Malaysia uh, government has taken uh, measures and plans to rectify the, uh, the issues. So one of the um, challenges is the, in terms of legal or policy issues. There are overabundance of sectoral based water laws. Okay. Laws govern use rather than protection of resources. And many laws uh, are outdated, redundant, or ambiguous. Conflicts occur or overlaps common. I wish I will discuss further on this issue. And lack of comprehensive water law. And inadequate penalties. Sometimes penalties are very low for big companies. Yeah. Uh, the American constitu uh, constitutions, land and water state matters, and rivers within jurisdiction of, uh, of state. Uh, in terms of institutional issues, so institutional issues is part of the uh, integrated water resource management. So there are little or no formal mechanism to integrate and coordinate activities on water. 
So there are numerous ministries and departments uh, that relegate and manage various water sectors. And there are duplication of efforts and are gaps in their um, efforts. And there are also competition and conflicts among uh, agencies. And there are also no apex organizations, but there are uh, a few apex now. Okay, there are uh, a few apex organizations uh, uh, established by the government now. And there are little or no public particip participation. And there is also growing recognition on the need for proper management and coordinated efforts to integrate various disciplines throughout whole development cycle. Uh, I take uh, Belum Temanggur as an example here. So this is the uh, Temanggur Lake, uh, but, uh, bordered by a, a few uh, forests, Royal Bloom State Park, Great Forest Reserve, and also Banding Reserve. So uh, the um, forests here, the uh, authorities and government uh, agencies who take care of this uh, forest area, for example, Department of Life and National Parks, uh, Peninsula Malaysia, Perak State Park Corporation, and Forestry Department, Perhutanan, and Department of Orang Asli or Aboriginal uh, Development. So when anything uh, unfortunate happened here, for illegal, for example, illegal logging, so people quite uh, confused to which department they should approach. So when they approach um, um, wildlife, for example, so this area under Perak State Corporation. And for example, here the um, Temenggur uh, Reservoir. So uh, there are agencies who work on this uh, reservoir, for example, Department of Fisheries, uh, Tenaga National Brahat, who, uh, uh, who, who manage and uh, produce uh, electricity, and Department of Irrigation and Drainage. Part of the tasks are overlapping uh, or redundant. Um, they also take a uh, water sample to be analyzed they, uh, for their own uh, usage. And when we as a researcher approach them to get some information, so then quite uh, reluctant to, if, to share with us and also their work and tasks also quite redundant. So uh, we, we don't have any repository uh, to share data and we do not know who's, who's doing what. Okay, that's the problem. And um, this is the timeline of uh, Indonesia government to tackle the issues and challenging challenges in uh, in um, managing water resources. During the colonial uh, periods uh, and first decades after independence, we in the, we got our independence in 1957. Uh, Water resources degradation was viewed as an inevitable consequence of development. So at this stage, uh, laws were formulated to promote sustainable use of water and other natural resources, but were not aimed at associated water issues. So um, government has taken charge on that. Um, uh, so laws are formulated at the federal levels to be uh, implemented at state levels. And at the state levels uh, were further uh, implemented at the local governments, uh, at the municipal and uh, district authorities. But the problem is they are overlapping in the functions and enforcement among state governments and various local governments because, because different state governments has its own needs and political influence to work independently on these laws and identify transmissory issues. So that's why each state has their own um, laws. That's why each state government has their own water tariff and water tariffs is different among the states in Malaysia. Okay. So the... Um, But Malaysia has uh, played an important role through its policies, plans, and programs. So the following uh, slides will show um, the uh, plans, um, management, or uh, policies 
taken by governments to overcome the issues and challenges to manage our water resource. So National Water Resource Council uh, on the NWRC was set up in 1999. Uh, the objective is to avoid fragmented water resources planning and development. So previously, the, uh, the planning and developments are quite uh, fragmented. So to avoid this, uh, the Water uh, Resource Council was developed and to take over all function related to water resources to ensure coordination of various stakeholders between federal and state government. So the previous slide I showed, there is, uh, there is no coordination between federal and state government. So in this regard, Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment was established in 2004. So uh, to, uh, to achieve our objectives, so water resources management are carried out by uh, various ministry for various um, purposes. For example, Ministry of Water, Energy and Communication uh, look into water services monitoring and supervision. And Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment look into monitoring and saf uh, safeguarding of water resources and natural resources. And Ministry of Health, they look into the drinking water supply. And local governments and the state governments, they uh, take charge into the water planning and development. And Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation look into water research uh, and development. Um, so to show the, uh, the timeline, the, 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 um, the, the flow chart of what's happening in Malaysia. So National Water Service Industry Commission Bill and Water Services Industry Act were uh, amended in 2006 uh, to look into the water resources under the state jurisdiction under the provisions of National Water Service Commission Act uh, and Water Services Industry Act. All this to ensure that the quality uh, and uh, water supplies are reliable uh, and also to look into the sewerage uh, services. So to further uh, improve to further um, uh, improve this um, um, efforts, two apex bodies were established, National Water Services Industry Commission. Uh, they employed the Water Services Industry Act 2006 as regulatory tools to regulate water services industry in terms of li uh, licensing, supervision, and monitoring. Another uh, apex bodies, National Water Resources Council and National Water Services Commission were formed at national level for safeguarding the, the water resources. And for private sectors, NGOs, and community-based organiza organizations are encouraged to participate in consultation for water sector development project and provide a collaborative decision making in plenary water resource planning in national and local uh, plans. Under the enabling environment, water vision in support of vision 2020 towards achieving developed nation status, Malaysia will conserve and manage uh, its water resource to ensure adequate and safe water for all, including the environment. And National Water Resource Council, uh, which is formed in 1999, is chaired, was chaired by Prime Minister uh, at the federal and state uh, represented by federal and state uh, agencies, and also uh, they are also involved in policy uh, make, uh, making. So national water policy was implemented, and two prong approaches to water resources, which are we regard water as a resource, including planning, integrated and holistic approach, and water as a service for uh, its efficiency uh, to improving service delivery. Under the institutional framework, we re-engineer our ministries. So Ministry of Natural Resources, like I showed in the previous slide, uh, play its, their role in water as a resource. Ministry of Energy, Water and Communications, uh, look into water as a utility, uh, uh, utility utility and Ministry of Agriculture and agro based Industries look water as a, a source for food. And for example, in Selangor, in the state uh, in Peninsula Malaysia, an apex organization was formed. Uh, we call it Selangor Water Management Authority or SWMA. So SWMA will become a model system for other states 
uh, to manage uh, their water uh, water resources in terms of river basin and also lakes and also uh, catchment area. And we have Malaysian Water Partnership. Uh, actually, Water Partnership is uh, organizations of institutions. It's an, a network committed to the doubling uh, principles. So under the Water Partnership, there are more, I think now more than 67 institutional members from government departments, private companies, association and NGOs. So Malaysia is part of uh, uh, water, my water partnership. So under uh, water partnership, we have a Malaysian capacity building network for integrated water resource management in 2001, established in 2001 under the auspices of my water partnership. So um, uh, they are located in University of Malaysia, Malaysia or National University of Malaysia. Uh, the support supported by 15 institutions of higher learning and organizations that have similar interest in promoting integrated water resource management in Malaysia through education and training. And also they work on uh, to, to produce a module for public sector. Under the management instruments, so we have legal instruments. Uh, we have uh, um, um, improved our water law and we have further uh, zoning or protecting uh, for catchment areas and better enforcement. Uh, under financial instruments, uh, government has put huge investments to improve water sector and somebody, uh, water, water uh, service has been privatized. Yeah, um, and water tariffs will, imp uh, will improve. Low water tariff also is not good, although local people uh, like it. Uh, we, uh, so we have to look into water tariffs to better conserve the water. But at the same time, uh, the water is still of, uh, can be afforded by uh, local uh, uh, for the um, other um, um, community. Yeah. And other planning instrument under uh, the, uh, Malaysia also uh, adopt integrated water resource management plans. We have uh, integrated river basin management and also integrated lake basin management plans. So it's quite a uh, huge topic to be discussed here uh, in this short uh, presentation. So we have to look into the supply and uh, enhancements to meet the demand. So we have to better uh, manage the demand um, and so that supply can be improved. Okay. And so we have to increase the education and public awareness through campaigns and we target the young, yeah? for example, to campaign for uh, to save uh, water. And uh, Academy of Science um, uh, Malaysia um, the Academy of Science Malaysia as uh, thought Academy of Science Malaysia, it is the, the name in, in Bahasa, in English it is the um, Academy of Science Malaysia or ASM, as a thought leader in science, technology and innovation or SDI, strives to address the needs of the nation by providing the best advice that is independent, credible, relevant and timely. So uh, Water Test Forces was established under Academic Science Malaysia uh, to look into this task, integrated lake basin management, integrated aquifer systems management, water demand management, water supply and wastewater uh, management, climate change and water, integrated river basin management was put into um, with the help into the effort of ASM. IRBM has been put into nice management plan and also under national physical plan. And uh, to look into the water and agriculture um, management. Um, so uh, water management under the, as national key, uh, key priority area in the water sector. And uh, one of the ASM mega science study is under the um, water sector. So one of the efforts um, uh, under ASM, so credit to, to be given to the Dr. Salma Zakaria, uh, which I took uh, some of the, uh, her present, presentation uh, presented during 19 World Lake Conference in, in, in Japan. So she has given a very comprehensive 
um, presentation on what Malaysia has been uh, has been doing in terms of integrated water resource management, particularly on integrated lake basin management. So there are ten component plans for the national integrated water resource management plan. All the chairs of the task force of each of the 10 components plans summarize the status of their subsectors sub for the NIWRP to ensure inclusiveness. And to other sub, for other subsectors sub of each of which the task force have yet to be set, a complementary report was requested from the respective subject matter experts. And there are a total of 14 complementary reports were submitted for this um, um, efforts. And this is timelines um, uh, 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 work by the Academic Science Malaysia in terms of water. Uh, reports from Academic Science Malaysia Water Community. The Water Community was, was formed in 2007. And over the years, several reports have been uh, published uh, in terms of um, uh, in, to enhance water demand, so a strategic plan for integrated water uh, river basin management, water supply and wastewater management services in Malaysia, and also um, for agriculture, yeah, in terms of agriculture water services for agro business. So they the Academic Science Malaysia have been doing a good uh, work in uh, in uh, in helping uh, government to manage water resource. In quite recent, uh, they have produced a report in 2016. Uh, the title of the report is the Transforming the Water Sector, National Integrated Water Resource Management, the Strategies and Roadmaps, quite thick and quantity, I think hundreds of pages. Uh, so in this report, um, um, so the release of the the release of this report is Timely, a timely contribution by Academic Science of Malaysia to assist the government in repeating its commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. So we uh, um, ASM play its role in helping the governments to achieve Sustainable uh, Development Goals, particularly uh, Goals number six, to achieve clean water and sanitation. Um, so our uh, my next uh, slides will uh, touch on the roles of Malaysian scientists towards ICN inland water research. Actually, to uh, to discuss their roles is quite uh, needs a longer and uh, it's quite difficult to to give in 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 detail. For for this uh, discussion, I just summarize um, general research trust. Uh, that we have uh, in terms of uh, research uh, in inland water, uh, inland water bodies. So in terms of biodiversity, yeah, in terms of biodiversity, uh, whether terrestrial and also aquatic systems, in terms of geology, hydrology, geomorphology, uh, environmental modeling, environmental conservation, remote sensing and GIS, socioeconomic, ethnobotany and river engineering. So, uh, Malaysian scientists are uh, actively involved in ASEAN organization, for example. Uh, um, many of us uh, involve uh, our uh, part members of CINET, MTGT, ASEAN, to name a few. And we actively uh, organize and participate in conferences and other opportunities to provide educational uh, related to Indian research. And we collaborate a lot with other global networks, universities, and institutions to promote education, research, and capacity building, uh, capacity building efforts in the ASEAN region. Uh, we are also involved in developing and promoting students, academia, and expert exchange programs, and credit exchange programs for undergraduate and postgraduate studies among the ASEAN members. And among the initiatives, uh, particularly by uh, USM, we provide various incentives. Yeah, uh, for example, in in Southeast Malaysia, we we um, we uh, uh, we have USM free tuition fee for two semesters to attract more postgraduate postgraduate students from a local and also from international. So I'm in the uh, last slide of my uh, at the end of my uh, presentation to conclude. 
as Malaysia develops, problems related to water and environments is expected to intensify. To ensure sustainable development, water resources need to be managed in an integrated and holistic manner. Political and administrative framework and commitment uh, are vital to ensure success. Management instruments are necessary. With that, I thank you and terima kasih. Thank you very much for the excellent and comprehensive presentation, Prof. One. I note some important information here. Malaysia facing several problems related to water uh, resources, for example, water shortage and flooding and water pollution, sedimentation. And Prof. One also said that uh, the main choice behind the issue, uh, also the, there are complex challenges there. And there are some institution uh, who are responsible for the management of water resources and also Malaysia has a ASM, Water Task Force. So in the last part, uh, Prof. Wan said that Malaysia actively collaborate uh, to worldwide scientists uh, and promote exchange students for undergraduate and postgraduate from, as a, from ASEAN countries, of course. And this is good news because some of our participants today is uh, are a student, so I think this is very good opportunity which offered by Malaysia. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Wan. Uh, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, let's move to our fourth presenter. So our fourth presenter, Ms. Kantana Intafong. She is a lecturer in National University of Laos. Her expert in groundwater and groundwater engineering. So she's working with the water quality test, fauna and flora survey, potassium mining project at Kamanom Province, Lao PDR, and also data collection road survey for Vientian Pangkiet in Laos. Today, Ms. Intafong is going to share about issues and challenges to inland water management in Lao PDR. So, Ms. Intafong, you are most welcome to present the topic. Uh, we could, we can hear your voice. Can you hear me? Yeah, maybe louder. Uh, okay. yes. Thank you very much, Intafong. Okay, I will share the screen. You, you can see that. One can see the screen. Yeah. No? Yeah, we can see. Maybe you can maximize it. It's okay. You can see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for having me today. And I'm delighted to to here to present the topic of issue and challenge in inland water management in Lao PDR. I'm representative of Dr. Kamla in, in Kavilai uh, due to he is tied up with another work. Yeah. And let me start about for the introduction. I will talk about Lao a little bit. For Lao Pedia is located in the heart of 
here in the heart of the the indo chinese peninsula it is the landlocked country that there are uh, about 7.5 million of people and the area around 230,800 kilometers square and the capital city is Vientiane. Yes, and if one is a uh, geography, the land area is covered with mountain and hills over 70%, and the river and stream for white great potential for uh, hydropower de development. And the reason why Laos has uh, many dams. Sorry. Yes. And next, this one is um, the map show about the Mekong River flow from Northern Park to Southern Park is around 1,835 kilometers. And And this one, they have the lower Mekong Basin is con contained within Lao. And next, this the table is so about that uh, the biggest catchment area in, in Lao, the main river of Lao, increasing of uh, 11 basin that's so in, in the table. And this one, in Laos, we have uh, two, two wetlands that it could in Kuching of uh, Sai Champon wetland and Bung Kien Ngong wetland that the, the located in the central and, and southern part of Laos. That I will show you in, in the map. For the, for the water resources, the country is located in, in, in Mekong Naval Basin, basin allowed by 90%, 90, 90 and, and we use the surface, surface water and groundwater, but groundwater is, uh, we use less than surface water. The water using for agriculture, industry, and household that allow 90, 93% we use for education and, and livestock. And this one we show the, the main type of water resources that we use surface water. And next for the illicate cow, we use for rice farm and vegetable. And this one, I will talk about uh, inland water transportation that we have uh, 29 parts along the Mekong River that we have the, the connection with Japan in in Vientian capital and and for the Thailand and Myanmar and also China that uh, I will show you in in the map the along of Mekong River and this one I will talk about hydropower that we have the biggest two biggest the hydropower across the the Mekong that. 
uh, for in northern part of Laos. We call this is the Sanyabuli Dam. And for the southern part of Laos, we call this uh, Don Sahong. And next one, that we also have another dam in the central park that located in Boli Kamsai and Kamwan. And this one, uh, the, the picture will show about the Nam Ngum Reservoir. It's the biggest lake in, in Laos and the in installed capacity is 155 megawatts that uh, allow 80 percent of electric we we uh, have to tran transport it to thailand and this one i i will talk about a uh, national water issue that we have a uh, agreement on cooperation for the sustainable development of Mekong River Basin in 1995. And another one, there are uh, 12 agencies in the water sector, such as uh, irrigation de department, hydro power de development, and inland water transportation. And we also have um, many issues in law and and responsibility of various agency of for specific activity. For the for the international water issue, we we also have the agreement on the cooperation for the sustainable development of um, Mekong River Basin and agreement on joint management and develop of uh, the economy that with uh, Cambodia, Thailand and Vietnam. And for, for the China and Myanmar became dialogist partner of the, the MRC. And also the ADB and World Bank have collaborated since 2004, and they have to prepare work, confirm that there, there is a, a need for extensive and also expect in integrate water resources management. For the water management in 2050, uh, the government had done for domestic water supply uh, about 80 percent and we also have the a lot of ministry and office for who respond to to water management that's we'll show you in the slide and next i will talk the sharing in in case of uh, Lao, if uh, the the increasing of population, it will impact to the the water quality and quantity. And we have the water waters lead in Cambodia and Thailand, but we we have the hydro power that uh, the result is a, a tradition for of, of live, labor pro and sediment balance, which for the fishing, bio, biodiversity and the water supply for education. And next, the, the expansion of, of agriculture of agriculture and and this livestock will affect to to the forest and bio 
biodiversity which compact which impact on runoff and erosion and um, hydroelectric development in in northern park has has impact on on the lower basin and I think that this this one is uh, we have to cooperation with with uh, Cambodian and Vietnam to to improve or to uh, how can I say <laughs> and 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 next some hydro power projects and are under construction is low lower Mekong basin at least well well mean system and and they have they have the plan for the future to to boost the dam allow to to achieve them and for the clean caring of uh, flash forest and die forest in on which land is habitat for for agriculture and this one is also talk about the catchment vegetation erosion uh, sedimentation and the the water extraction from with land area pumping for irrigation digestion that impact to to rice farm and invasive species it the uh, also impact to climate and climate change. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Ms. Intafong. Uh, I highlight some points from Ms. Intafong's presentation that even though it's a landlocked country, which doesn't have a coastline, right? Uh, it has a huge potential of inland water as hydropower. And it mentioned that Mekong has a role, a uh, big role in Laos, whereas most of the people concentrate around the river basin, right? And aside of Mekong River, Laos has two Ramsar Sark, if I'm not mistaken, ex Kampun wetland and Bingkat Ngong wetland. And I think it's very important information. And some other issues and challenges in Laos. First, the increase of water demand in, the, in tandem with the rules of population by 3, 30%. 30%. And then Mekong River is not only essential for Laos, but also for other countries around Laos, including Cambodia, Thailand, and also Vietnam. So they have a joint management of water resources and development of the economic potential of the river. And uh, hydropower uh, has many impact uh, to the environment and water quality and also the biodiversity. Thank you very much, Ms. Intafong. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with our last but not the least presenter, Professor Masahisa Nakamura. So, Professor Nakamura, he working in the Research Center for Sustainability and Environment, Siga University, Japan, and he's also the Vice President of International League Environment Committee, Japan. His expertise is water and environmental policy and planning, lake basin management and governance. He has some research project here. First, global water and environmental policy and governance, integrated lake basin management or ELBM, and also development of knowledge base and database system for ILBM. Today, Nakamura Sensei, 
Professor Nakamura will speak about the need to mainstream tropical and other Atlantic water bodies in the ASEAN agenda. So due to the technical uh, trouble, trouble today, Professor Nakamura will be um, present by Miss Lenny as uh, the representative of ILEC. Okay, Hello, um, yes, uh, I'm here. Thank you, Im, and uh, we apologize for that uh, technical difficulty that Professor Nakamura is uh, having right now. So this mm -hmm. is an on-the-spot assignment. I hope I can do justice to the presentation of uh, Professor Nakamura. So can we start with the first slide? I'll, I'll as a guide to the secretariat, I will just say next for the for the next slide okay 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 ohayo gusaimas good morning everyone and uh, i'm doing this presentation in behalf of professor nakamura but he is uh, he is actually in the webinar it's just that he cannot uh, get into the the presentation uh, system so um the talk is about the mainstreaming uh, lakes and Atlantic waters uh, in the global water uh, agenda. And uh, Professor Nakamura is uh, the vice president of ILEC and at the same time a professor of the Shiga University. So next slide, please. Okay, uh, let's talk about the global water system. Next slide. So, um, this is a, uh, a global uh, presentation of uh, the various uh, lakes and uh, wetlands. And it's good that there is an existing database uh, for uh, that's uh, prepared by the University of Kassel in Germany. So um, you see the distribution of lakes are in the European region, in Africa, uh, of course, in our part of South Asia. For a uh, database of four lakes, you can also visit the ILAC website. Next slide. Now, the this the water in in the in uh, in in the world or in planet Earth is mostly composed of uh, marine water, or there are most of them like ninety seven percent is found in the ocean, and only uh, two point five percent actually. Uh, is uh, fresh water and they are trapped mostly in glaciers and ice caps and in groundwater but the surface water per se is only 1.2 percent and yet this is the resource where we get a lot of goods and services we get our drinking water from surface water but the composition is just 1.2 percent so what is being stressed here is the need to have a a, a closer look and a, a closer, a deeper concern on our surface water resources. Next slide. Next, please. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> our Atlantic waters are intricately uh, linked with other water systems. The lakes are connected to rivers and then uh, groundwater also supply uh, water to our lakes. And um, of course, Everything goes to the estuarine waters and to the ocean. Next. Now, how do we uh, compare this, uh, the Atlantic and the hydrostatic uh, system? This, this Atlantic Atlantic is just an expression of ecological and anthropogenic states of water with evolutional and historical memories of human and nature interaction. While hydrostatic, hydrodynamic, it refers to movement. It just expresses the physical state of water. Next. Next. And uh, yeah, can we go to the, okay, let's proceed with the lakes in the tropical regions. Next slide. So near that, of course, uh, near the tropics you find here in the tropic of between the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn are our uh, tropical uh, ecosystem. And uh, these are where the major, the tropical lakes of course are, are found. So uh, this is uh, 
done or published in hydrobiology, so you can just uh, access it through there. Next. Next. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, can you be more slow in shifting the slide? Uh, can you uh, proceed? Can you go back? So what is being stressed here is that the tropical regions are also the regions with highly vulnerable lentic and lotic water ecosystems. And uh, these are based on global studies uh, done by uh, various uh, agencies. So next slide, let's go to uh, our lakes. So let's go to the lentic water features. First, the, the integrating nature of uh, lentic water. So everything comes together. Uh, you have a picture here of Lake Biwa and everything that uh, comes from the watershed are eventually uh, collected into the lake. So that's where all the interaction comes in next. So we have the integrating nature, the long retention time. So also it means that problems remain long and finding solutions also takes a longer time. And there is slow natural dynamics. So everything happens in a gradual way. and uh, it takes time sometimes before we see the effect of what we are doing on our lakes. Next slide. Okay, so let's focus again on the integrating nature of lake. So what is the implication? The issues are mostly inseparable, long retention time. So the changes are gradual and mostly invisible. And the slow natural dynamics that events are often unpredictable and uncontrollable and technological interventions are rare. We would like to emphasize here the ecosystem service. So we have the resource provision service, the regulating service, and the supporting service, and at some point the cultural service. So how do we maintain the balance between the provisioning service and the regulating service of our ecosystem? Next slide. Okay, let's go to the resource provision service and the regulating service, cultural and supporting service. I think there is more if you click. Okay, so the resources that we get from the lake, of course, everyone wants this resource. We put value in this. But often we tend to forget the value of the regulating service of our lakes of our ecosystem, the cultural service it provides and the supporting service, because what is most tangible to us always is the resources that we derive from our uh, ecosystem. Next. Okay, next. So, the ex you see here that the, 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 the link of this, that if, if we exploit our resource provision service, we lost our regulating service. Click, please, next. And it also affects the cultural services of our ecosystem. So without timely conservation, all these ecosystem services may disappear. So of course, including the supporting service of our ecosystem. Next slide. Next. This is where the integrated lake basin management uh, approach comes uh, to, into play and it, it plays a really a very, very important role. The ILBM was developed through a series of uh, looking at the experiences and lessons learned in lakes in various parts of the uh, continent. And um, there are six pillars of integrated lake basin management. We have the institutions, the participation of the stakeholders, policies, technology, information and finance. So you could see here that uh, we have the, the hardware approach and the software approach. In fact, I hope it's here that aside from the software, we have the hardware approach and these are, you know, people participating in all these things and the concern of every stakeholder. Next slide. Oh, so the hardware is there. 
although we have the six pillars, the six pillars in, in any of our lakes would not be in the same strength. Some pillars may be strong, some pillars may be weak. In fact, some pillars may still be uh, lacking. Next slide. Okay, this is a cyclic process of the uh, ILBM. So looking at uh, building the pillars of ILBM, next slide. So we have to acknowledge the state of our lake basin. We, we really know to resource in order to uh, manage it well. We need to identify the issues, the needs and the challenges, and we need to seek ways to strengthen the governance pillars. So you could see here that you're you know, fixing the pillars is a, is, a, is a role not just by any one person, but it requires collective action. Next slide. And um, we have to continue the efforts to eventually reach the long-term goals. And it's a cyclic process of monitoring, uh, recognition surveys, inventory, building up the database. And uh, hopefully we can reach the goal. And so far as uh, integrated lake basin management is concerned. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> The ILBM process can is actually uh, can be done in several phases, and it will depend on the condition in each of the uh, countries or in each of the lake. And um, we need uh, the the legal institution in order to uh, move this to move this uh, kind of uh, uh, process for an effective management of our lake basin resources. Next slide. From the previous uh, presentations and uh, also from our interaction with our SealNet members and also from uh, ILEC uh, members and uh, partners that the knowledge on tropical limnology is increasing, but the climate change implications facing the tropical regions are yet very limited. Next slide. Uh, yeah, we can... Uh, Keep this. Next slide. Okay. So the point of uh, Dr. Nakamura here is to um, present to you the climate change implications on lakes and Atlantic waters. So let's go to the next slide. The typical climate change impacts include those on water resources, terrestrial, coastal, and marine ecosystems, agricultural production and human health among the populations with low adaptive capacity. Next slide. Flooding is, uh, of course, a serious issue. I, I remember this one. This was uh, Typhoon Katsana or Typhoon Ondoy in 2009 uh, in the Laguna de Bay uh, Basin. And this is really a very, it's a shocking incident. It awakened us all. Next slide. Then droughts are experienced in uh, other countries. And, uh, you know, even in Lake Biwa in Japan, drought is being experienced. Uh, Lake Chilica in Mexico, uh, drought is also very evident. Next slide. And a lot of this whole water, uh, human water security threats uh, due to uh, the impacts of this uh, climate change. Next slide. Also, biodiversity and livelihood is uh, severely affected. Next slide. And uh, in terms of hardware, there are also security threats. For example, this is a very, very um, prominent and important pilgrimage site in uh, Pushkar Lake in India. And uh, due to uh, drought and, uh, of course, a coming climate change impacts, there is drought. So it has really affected the, the pilgrims uh, looking at their pilgrimage sites with no water. And you know that uh, culturally and uh, traditionally and the religious, in terms of uh, the religious aspect also, that in India, water is very, very important uh, with regards to their uh, practice of their faith. Next slide. 
let's go to the Luotic water uh, features. Uh, remember in the previous slides, we um, presented the, the lensic water features. So let's go to the Luotic water features. First, it's, it's very transient nature. So everything flows downstream. It doesn't stay long in one particular point of the river. There is a short retention time. So the products get transported from upstream to downstream. And next, uh, the third is there is rapid natural uh, dynamics. So most phenomena are fast and uh, short lived. So you'll see that this is exactly the opposite of the lensic water uh, features. Next slide. So even if it's uh, transient in nature, it's still like everything flows downstream, but still the issues are mostly uh, here. It's, it's separable. You can pinpoint already like which particular section of the river does did the problem come from. It has a short attention time. So the problems get transported from upstream to downstream. That's why there is a need to have a closer uh, team, uh, team up and collaboration uh, between the upstream and downstream communities. And then, uh, yeah, I think it's too fast. The, let's go to the last one. Then the rapid di uh, natural dynamics is that often this is also unpredictable and uncontrollable. But again, uh, here it says that te technical, technological interventions are common, which is uh, previously in lakes, uh, the technical, technological intervention are still uh, considered as rare. Next slide. So let's look at the lensic water features and the feature the climate change features. So the integrating nature, so every human activity adds up. So you can see that there is a similarity between the climate change features and the lensic water features. So the issues are intertwined. It's like uh, everything is connected and uh, mixed. Next. The latency and time lag, of course, uh, it took long before we um, experienced the impacts of climate change. So the problems remain long and the finding solutions also takes a very, very long time. Also, the changes are gradual and mostly uh, invisible. And similar to lakes, this complex response with the dynamics, so everything else uh, it affects uh, Others. So the consequences are often unpredictable and uncontrollable. Uncontrollable. Next. Now, this climate change impact on Atlantic waters is also interlinked with water with Atlantic waters. So, which would be both uh, direct and indirect. Direct in terms of temperature, precipitation. Indirect in terms of watershed hydrology and human behavioral changes. Next. Also, the human use of the ecosystems like the flora and fauna and uh, the ecosystem services also like the fish catch, the water quality and quantity. Next slide. Let's uh, now talk about uh, these adaptations and mitigations, especially now at this uh, very trying time. So next slide. So we already have serious challenges for those uh, especially depending their livelihood on lake, lakes like the riparian fishermen and farmers. And um, there is also uh, barriers uh, which should be considered also within the broader sustainable development uh, challenges. So health and livelihood adaptation issues are directly related to the preservation of the lentic and lotic biodiversity, so lakes and rivers biodiversity and disaster prevention and adaptation are emerging issues. Next. In terms of uh, water quantity, it's generally related to the control of the lake and river interactions, such as floods and drought. Water quality where eutrophication is a typical issue. It's possible that, that the increase in the contamination by chemicals is also discussed in terms of uh, this water quality, in fact, it is really discussed in so far as water quality is concerned, and the more uh, investment is needed for nutrient plan of mitigation. And of course, ecosystem degra de degradation. So uh, 
habitat alteration has been experienced in a lot of our lakes and uh, there's a need to create new protected areas for like fish sanctuaries. Next slide. So what is uh, being stressed here is the need to have a broader uh, societal uh, changes. And the ILBM platform process at the levels of the individual lake basins, local government, national government, and APEC international level have to be uh, closely monitored both on the horizontal and the vertical scale. Next slide. So let's uh, move now to the concluding part of the Dr. Nakamura's presentation. Next slide. Next slide, please. So lakes and other uh, Atlantic waters have been a major missing link in the global water agenda. Many continental regions with a high con concentration of lakes and other Atlantic waters, including the Great Lakes, urban lakes, and high-altitude cluster lakes, lie in the tropical climate region. Such regions also coincide with high human water security threats as well as high biodiversity security threats. Next slide. Scientific knowledge on tropical lakes and their climate change impact has been growing, but its scope has to be has to interface better with the concept of integrated lake basin management. We have to accelerate integration into ILBM of key tropical limnology issues for better cross fertilization of experience and knowledge. And the above approach is consistent with the build back better concept toward the post COVID 19 era. So let's take note of the build back better concept. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, I, think the, I think that's the end of the presentation. So uh, okay. thank you very much. And in behalf of Dr. Nakamura, we apologize for uh, some technical glitch. And I hope I was able to do some justice to his presentation. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Ms. Lenny, as the representative of ILEC, which has substituted for uh, Professor Nakamura today due to the technical problem. Um, he couldn't join us today. And I highlight some point from Ms. Lenny presentation that uh, tropical inland water is highly vulnerable Atlantic Lotic water system. And she also talk about the future of Atlantic and, Lo Atlantic and Lotic water and also the climate change. Mm -hmm. And she promotes the integ integrated lake basin management ILBM platform as a guideline for stakeholder to achieve sustainable management of lakes and their basins. So that was the last presentation. We have already completed the last part of the presentation session. We have five different presentation today from five different country. Uh, and we have uh, some audience here. I would like to give a credit for all presenter and for your excellent presentation today for based on the uh, experience. Now we will move to the discussion session. We already have some question here in our hand and I will go one by one for the speaker. Please be ready. So the first question from Christeta Galano from Philippines. The questions for Dr. Lucky regarding floodplain ecosystem and connectivity with the river is this considered part of a river basin management? Do you have a publication on this? Uh, thank you. Dr. Lucky? Dr. Lucky? Dr. Lucky, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we move to the second, second question. This is from Krista Tagalano. Uh, for, from Philippines for Dr. Oh, for Miss uh, Lenny, can you share any idea comparing AUF and payment ecosystem services? Oh yes, um, there are uh, two pronged approach, and I'm glad that that question is asked because uh, the LLDA uh, 
is one also the Laguna Lake is one of the pilot site for this um, wealth accounting and valuation of ecosystem services. So the 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 approach is uh, different. EUF is of course we're dealing uh, with a resource and uh, it's basically a, a a fine or a fee that you pay plus some fines if you violate. And this is part of a discharge permit system of the Laguna Lake Development Authority. But for the, um, uh, for example, for the payment of ecosystem services, um, you could say that yes, there, there, there is sort of a, a, a uh, some sort of a similarity because a part of the EUF is being uh, is being shared with the community with the other stakeholders and also being used by LLDA for its uh, environmental uh, protection uh, efforts. So in a way, yes, there is some semblance. And I, I just mentioned about this wealth accounting and valuation of ecosystem services. So this is approach that hopefully uh, will really gain ground on putting a value, a money value on the resource so that you can have you can formulate a, a, a very a responsive poli policy in so far as resource management is uh, concerned. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lenny, for the excellent uh, answer, I think. And we will move to another question. This is uh, from Rizky Akbar from Indonesia. Uh, the question is for Professor Wan Matna. Disposal of domestic waste from the community in the lake waters is a problem in itself and of course has an impact on water damage. Are there any scientific approaches to deal with the domestic waste, for example, using bacteria or active substances? So please, Prof Wan. Um, can, I, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, okay, okay. okay. Disposal of domestic waste from the community in the lake waters is a problem in itself and of course has an impact to the water damage. Mm -hmm. Are there any scientific approaches to deal with the domestic waste? Hey, for Rainy, example, thank using you. bacteria or active substances? <laughs> no, 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 no. That was very good. No, it seems like... A <laughs> Professor Nagamura? Yes. Nagamura? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, glad to hear that you can join. Right. <laughs> we, we will postpone for the question for Prof. Wan for a while. I will greet Prof. Nakamura here. So, okay. welcome, Professor Nakamura. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Lenny. And uh, it was better than my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Uh, okay, to answer the questions okay. uh, regarding the uh, domestic waste, they are, we have a proper channel for uh, people and community to, um, to, um, mm. to put their to, to research uh, their waste. But in terms of scientific approach, I don't know, I'm not so, so quite sure what you mean by scientific approach. Of course, scientifically, we have a very, um, various scientists involved in uh, in using, uh, for example, bioremediation uh, bio to better improve the uh, water, water quality by using um, plants, for example, we call it uh, FICO remediation. I mean myself, I use microalgae, we call it FICO remediation. And sometimes we use microbes to reduce the nutrient levels um, in water system. But the most important thing we, I would like to stress here that we can adopt uh, the approach by LLDA, we have to um, engage community um, uh, to better manage their waste. So, uh, but the problem is people regard water resource, for example, river, as dumping ground. So this mentality we have to we have to change. So we have to uh, to go into the uh, ground level to to educate them. 
Of course, we have scientific approach to uh, reduce the metric waste. But the most important thing is the, uh, the so society uh, themselves to have a better, um, uh, what we call it, uh, men uh, good me mentality towards uh, waste. We have, we, they hmm. cannot regard um, uh, water resources, for example, rivers as domestic waste. I, ho I hope I answer the, the question. Okay, so the next question. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Wan, for your answer. And then for the next question, we have some questions from Pak Nyoman Suryadiputra from Wetland Indonesia. So we will open the microphone so he can ask directly to the panelists because uh, He's very enthusiastic to um, is it with this uh, event. So we will open the microphone for Pak Nyoman. Please, Pak Nyoman. Danny, how are you? <laughs> so long no see. So I have questions to three of the presenters. The first okay, one please. I would like to ask yeah, to Lenny yeah, because the Laguna the Bay is located not far from the beach or from the sea. So what would you what would be the major impact of climate change? Yeah. Uh, for example, the temperature increases and in, could also be the sea level rises. How this would in the future impact it to the Laguna okay. the Bay? That's the first question. The second question to Lani, how would you deal with the accumulation of organic matters? Yeah. For example, from the excessive feeds. Of the fish excretions at the bottom of the lakes, yeah, especially when it comes from the floating uh, cages and also from the fences. Do you also apply the EUF for the fish farmers? So that's the two questions for Lenny. Should I ask further or later for Professor Wan Hasna and also to Professor Nakamura? Please advise. Okay. Um... Uh, hello, Nyoman. Hey. Yeah, I'm nice very pleased <laughs> that you are in this webinar. Uh, Nyoman and I were classmates uh, in Austria several years ago. Okay, mm. uh, regarding the first question, yes, Laguna Lake is linked to Manila Bay, and uh, there are already studies uh, like uh, in Manila Bay where um, a sea level rise is being experienced. So the, the connection of Laguna Lake to Manila Bay depends on the uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, conditions between the two ecosystems because Laguna Lake is generally uh, at a higher level than Manila Bay. So the water of the lake goes to Manila Bay. So it feeds water into Manila Bay. So uh, this could uh, in the future have a further impact in terms of Perhaps uh, let's wait for the modeling results on this uh, the impacts from the lake to uh, sea, level, sea level rise. But also with the rising in sea level, there might be frequent occurrence of salt water intrusion into the lake because that would mean that Manila Bay will be at a higher level, higher water level than Laguna Lake. So there would be uh, uh, some effect perhaps on the ecology, but the the western part of the lake, which is very close to uh, Manila Bay, is actually brackish water in nature. And I think with the, uh, unless the interventions are done, uh, there is a possibility that could, there could be a frequent salt water intrusion and it may reach the other uh, base of Laguna Lake and may alter the, uh, the ecology of this part of the lake. Uh, oh, a very big lake, uh, which is uh, 900 square kilometers. Regarding the second question on, um, on aquaculture, on the impacts of aquaculture, referring to the uh, unutilized sea, the, the excreta of the, of the fish, actually, um, artificial feeding is not allowed in Laguna Lake. Because the main reason why aquaculture was introduced was there was sufficient natural food from the lake. And based on the policy of LLDA and its implementing rules and regulation, artificial feeding is still not allowed in the 2019 uh, new uh, zoning and management plan. Now, um, 
with regards to the adoption of the AUF, actually that is uh, for further study. In fact, uh, the EUF was initially implemented for the point sources, the industries uh, within the basin, but uh, we have tried it also with, uh, we have presented this idea also with the uh, household waste, but uh, you know, uh, the willingness is, is really uh, very poor and uh, it was not really entertained as a sort of an approach. For the fisheries, perhaps uh, it's worth considering but uh, we have to develop the strategy on making sure because they are in the lake, we have to develop a strategy perhaps with the use of isotopes or some advanced technology that this waste really come from this owner of fish pen or this owner of fish cage. But it's worth uh, considering and uh, perhaps uh, let's have a, a uh, deeper uh, thinking on that aspect. Thank you. So thank you, Lenny. Should I proceed with Professor Hasna? Yes, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, yes, okay. So Dr. Nyoman, since Hasna. since uh, uh, you, uh, the uh, the um, you, you can talk, and why don't you uh, sh show your face? Uh, yeah. <laughs> My face. Is it, is it, I is it possible? It that. Can, can switch on the, the the video. I don't know how to do that. Maybe I am using the old <laughs> versions of uh, computer. <laughs> okay, okay, never mind. Never mind. Just joking. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So, Professor Wanasna, it's yeah. a very interesting presentation to you. Okay, but thank I you. Be concerned with the oil palm plantations, which mm -hmm. Malaysia is one of the largest oil palm producers in the world. Also yeah. Indonesia. And then I'm aware that many of these kind of uh, oil palm plantations, they are applying many a huge amount of chemicals, especially with the pesticides and also with the heavy metal, yeah, like the copper sulfate. Mm -hmm. So I saw directly in the field how they applying this kind of heavy metals mm -hmm. on the ground. So have you identified yeah, the impact of these chemicals to the aquatic biodiversity in the lake system or the river and the ecosystems? Uh, yeah, there are many uh, scientists involved in uh, uh, in in the study of the impacts of oil palm industries uh, in the receiving waters. Uh, impacts the the we also involved in many mechanisms to reduce the um, pollutants levels in terms of organic and also heavy metals. Yeah, there are studies. Uh, conducted to to uh, to determine the impacts of oil palm waste into the receiving waters, whether um, rivers, Atlantic or Atlantic eco ecosystems, and to be frank, it's quite a huge negative impacts to the water water systems. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Last but not least, uh -huh. this is my last question to Professor uh -huh. Nakamura. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you to Lenny who presented. Nakamura PowerPoint very nicely. Yeah. So uh, I'm very much concerned with the last uh, research conducted on the impact of global warming to the lake ecosystem. So my question here, as global warming rise the global temperature, I think we need to anticipate that the tropical lakes, which mostly oligomictic yeah, in the past, will becoming more rarely mixed as the water temperature gradients is becoming more sharp. So I would say the surface of water uh, in the lakes is become warmer and then it drops and then let's say the gradients becoming sharper. So my question, what will be the implication of such conditions to the lake, especially to the primary productions and also to the face productivity? So please, I don't know, maybe to Lenny or Professor Nakamura to respond. Thank you. Am I on? Yeah, yeah, for Nakamura, please. Yes, Professor Nakamura, please. Ini kenapa mute? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I uh, agree uh, in the sense that the impacts of global warming to tropical lakes 
uh, would be quite uh, significant in many uh, uh, respects, including uh, the uh, formation of strong uh, thermocline, uh, also maybe the wind uh, shear would be stronger, uh, and uh, the runoff pattern based on uh, the precipitation change and so on and so forth uh, would be uh, changing. And uh, according to what little I know of the scientists saying is one, this uh, uh, anticipated changes uh, by the global warming would depend very much by regions, very much by the uh, individual lakes, uh, very much uh, by the, the uh, lake basin situations. Uh, therefore, I think the, the, this is where the limnology scientists come in very uh, important, uh, the role they play. And I think uh, already uh, Luki-san and, uh, and uh, Dr. Wan and uh, many of these uh, Southeast Asian uh, limnologists are uh, working on individual lakes. Uh, we do have uh, people working on uh, tropical lakes in uh, Africa and uh, global warming implications and the all these African Great Lakes are very different uh, uh, scenarios they have to take into account. Uh, in, in general, the, the largest uh, sort of uh, impacts on global warming uh, takes place in the high latitude uh, regions, uh, therefore, the near the uh, uh, equators, uh, the change in uh, uh, temperature may not be as high as uh, the the poorer regions and so on. But at the same time, in the uh, these African regions, dry region, the Great Lakes, uh, Rift Valley lakes, they have what they call the amplifier effects. Uh, what turned out to be uh, what uh, may uh, look uh, very small in the outset may over time uh, very quickly amplify to uh, uh, produce something very significant. And this is uh, very much uh, uh, a concern in the East African Great Lakes region, which probably would be very different from the uh, Asian or South uh, American uh, cases. But anyway, I think uh, Dr. Luki and uh, maybe Dr. Juan Lenny uh, may want to add uh, a piece uh, or two uh, of uh, useful information to answer uh, this uh, very important question. Okay, thank you, Professor Nakamura for your answer. Actually, there is, we have so many questions here, but yeah, due to the time, we can continue to answer question, I see the question one by one. Uh, yeah, we lack of time for today. So this is a very high enthusiasm from our participant. And we have to, unfortunately, we have to finish this discussion session. Maybe uh, after this, uh, uh after this we have a closing statement from our speakers and i would like to re-invite all of our speakers today to give their closing first please dr Luki, give your final statement for today <clears throat> can you hear me okay thank you moderator yes yes thank you uh i'm sorry so i just also find got some trouble in my internet so after Professor Nakamura can log in and my trouble also. Uh, so uh, before closing statement I also saw some uh, question for me but uh, later maybe by uh, the committee can you support by email or by uh, we, we, we try to uh, respond that question okay. Uh, okay.
thing for the closing statement. Say so maybe I, I am not so tender. So uh, I think the collaboration uh, nowadays is a key point for uh, makes our uh, what is our yeah our research so our activities because uh, not only uh, collaboration between two countries or two institutions but also now is among uh, between uh, communities or between group like ASEAN like INLEC like WIPA and so on so more broader not not only only two parties or two uh, institutions so it is key point uh, as uh, from this uh, discussion it is important uh, uh, we, we, we uh, try to uh, build this uh, collaboration and initially by this uh, ASEAN region and uh, our ASEAN uh, and so on. And the second, I think that uh, for tropical immunology, uh, especially also, this uh, I think still many uh, uh, big question. I think I mean that uh, because we uh, still uh, use many reference from uh, subtropics or uh, temperate lakes, example. So, uh, but some uh, what is reference for water quality uh, standard example or some uh, how how the uh, status uh, tropic for our in the water in the tropical because it's very unique to different uh, uh, condition and different type in uh, subtropics. So it is uh, also including database. I think this is important also for uh, to inventories uh, in uh, <coughs> our. Uh, what is uh, potential uh, uh, in water to con to protect and for conservation? And uh, finally, uh, I hope that uh, after this uh, and next our uh, tropical immunology conference in November uh, 2020, so uh, we can continue also with uh, ASEAN, uh, especially uh, Dr. Augie and also Prof. To, uh, real, real, to realize the uh, partnership between uh, CNET and also uh, SAMSAT, uh, Subcommittee of Science and Technology. And also, of course, you all in our uh, ASEAN countries and the other can also participate and support this. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Luki. And for the second closing, please, from Prof. Wan Masnah, the time is yours. Um, my uh, closing statements is uh, more or less like uh, a summary from uh, from uh, information I gathered from the publications I gathered uh, done by American scientists regarding uh, integrated water resource management. Uh, particularly uh, IRBM and also ILBM. So um, uh, to summarize this, I can say that there is a conflict between water supply and, and demand. So uh, this is triggered by rapid population growth, urbanization, industrialization, and global climate change. So um, I think not only in Malaysia, but globally, water resources uh, need to be managed. I think my statement also uh, answer, I saw in the Q&A uh, chat box, uh, there, there was a question um, uh, to me actually, how can we um, manage river, uh, river ecosystem? So in my statement here, also indirectly answer that question. Water resources need to be managed in an integrated and systematic way uh, to ensure these resources can continue to meet not only the current and also for future uh, needs of so, uh, so society. So in this regard, Malaysian government has played an important uh, role through uh, its policies, plans and also programs. Uh, and uh, a holistic approach, a holistic approach such as the integrated water resource management, uh, is needed in water resources planning and development, and not only in Malaysia and also in uh, other Asian countries. Um, in Malaysia, water-related issues are intensively studied by universities, private and government agencies, non-governmental organisations. However, 
these mm. issues need to be addressed at national and regional levels because uh, there are no integrated study approach to enable the database to be properly developed uh, nationally and also inter internationally. And also there is no systematic effort to compile and share information on all inland waters in Malaysia and Asia countries. Among ourselves, um, uh, Malaysian scientists, we do not know who's doing what. Yeah. So this uh, to be addressed nationally and also regionally. And uh, there is no agreed template of information to be collected. So Dr. Prof. Nakamura, your legs is very timely. Yeah. Uh, there is no central, national, and international repository for information on inland waters in Malaysia and other Asian countries. So that is my uh, closing statement. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Juan. Mm -hmm. And for the third, I'll invite Miss Adelina. Please, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Miss Im. I'd like to state that the lakes in the ASEAN region are faced with similar challenges. Although the opportunities for necessary actions to address these challenges may be different based on the political, economic, and social conditions in each country. Opportunities may also differ in terms of the interest of scientists from various disciplines like limnology to pursue research in support of policy development with sufficient funding support. We also have different time frame in finding solutions to the most pressing threats to each of our lake. Some countries may be ahead, while some may be in the planning or implementation stage. We need to strengthen our network and collaboration in the spirit of learning from each other uh, countries from each country's lessons and waters, and also in promoting and driven research, not just in the ASEAN region, but in a more global scale as well. The COVID-19 pandemic promoted the use of technology to conduct a new face-to-face uh, -face meeting, just like what we are doing now and has transcended borders. So um, we can do it without even um, using our face masks. So let us make use of this common opportunity and I look forward to our next learning exchange. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lenny. So I'll invite Professor Nakamura for the, uh, for the final statement. Please, Professor Nakamura, can you hear me? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, clearly. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity, and uh, I uh, really appreciate the Secretariat to have put together this uh, webinar very nicely. Uh, actually, it was very good that uh, Lenny uh, took up this responsibility. I understand better now what, uh, what uh, this uh, uh, presentation that she, she made, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was very good for all of the, the uh, listeners, uh, participants, uh, to have uh, heard from her voice. Uh, and uh, let me emphasize one thing. ILEC uh, and uh, SEALNET countries, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, and, and, uh, and other countries, uh, Cambodia and so on, uh, have to uh, work together to mainstream this uh, lakes, not only tropical lakes, uh, but the global lakes, to be an issue to be uh, integrated into the main water uh, agenda. And this will take place uh, with the collaboration with the UNEP. Uh, and uh, we would like to ask uh, Secretariat, uh, through Secretariat, to share uh, this uh, step steps towards uh, this adoption of resolution that the Atlantics and Atlantic water and the lakes be mainstreamed uh, over the next uh, years, particularly upcoming uh, United Nations Environmental Assembly. And uh, I'm pretty sure many of the listeners, uh, some uh, uh, I'm pretty sure are from the governments 
uh, we like to uh, uh, work with the governments, as the Professor Muan said. Uh, we have Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, mm -hmm. and many other national governments working very uh, uh, closely among themselves. But at the same time, I think the scientists and governments has to work together uh, so that on the one hand, our research, uh, immunology, and otherwise, be progressed, but at the same time, the the issues of uh, managing uh, uh, lake basins and the water issues related to Atlantic waters would not wait for the scientists, wait for the uh, tropical science to, to progress. So we have to do both at the same time. So uh, we uh, definitely would like to keep in touch with uh, the speakers as well as the listeners to make sure that uh, we all uh, work towards mainstreaming this uh, sort of missing link in the global uh, water debates in particular. And uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. And I uh, am very uh, grateful for the Secretariat and Lenny and uh, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nakamura. It seems that Dr. Intafong already left the webinar, so I will continue to Dr. Michelle Chu. I would like to invite Dr. Michelle Chu to give a closing statement today. Dr. Michelle Chu, time's yours. Okay, thank you so much. Well, it has been a very long session, but it has been uh, very rich in terms of the information. Um, so without uh, holding everyone back, uh, I think uh, we should continue this interest and um, let's look forward to um, probably even more um, webinars of such kind and um, maybe going forward also to see how we can actually put in place um, the real collaborations for the researchers uh, to work together. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chu. Now, finally, this time is for closing. I would like to invite Dr. Augie Saheletua as the ASEAN Focal Point on Marine Science and Technology to give a closing remarks. Please, Dr. Augie, time is yours. Distinguished uh, guests and webinar participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to say a few words at the end of this webinar. As a director of Research Center for Oceanography, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, and focal point for Subcommittee of Marine Science and Technology, ASEAN COSTI, I'm, great, I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to advise and sponsor this event. In fact, as has been said early today, this is the first time we have organized an international webinar as a scientific event under the Asian Coast Subcommittee Marine Science and Technology. So thank you for your interest in following, uh, listening and participating in the entire webinar. As this webinar is now coming to the end, we have heard how some fields are well observed and others await for new exploration and innovations. This webinar also only held for less than half days has given us important insight about what we have been done in the last few decades in terms of research on inland water ecosystem. From our speakers talks, we heard that specific fields dealing with sedimentation, pollution, eutrophication, law enforcement have gathered the most intention. Whereas other fields such as integrated man water management, public awareness, disaster risk reduction and mitigation await for more activities to be done. However, in incomprehensive the topic might be due to the time constraint. It is our sensory wish that you can benefit the most of your presence and participating in this webinar. Organizing committee will try their best to compile all the video recording of the presentation delivery today to increase the impact 
and risk of the inland water ecosystem program. Other than that, feedback from you all in the completed evaluation form is essential to maintaining and improving the quality of these scientific meetings in the future. Again, I hope that the time spent making new acquaintance and having grateful discussion on the common interests of the webinar, the inland water ecosystem can lead to establishing new networks and strengthening the old ones. Research Center for Limnology, Indonesia Institute of Sciences and SEALNETS are committed to keep improving the infrastructure to be able to meet the demands of the research to be carried out and this particular inland water environment based on the knowledge gaps identified throughout this webinar. Now that we have come to the end of this same webinar, I would like to express my warm thanks to the organizers. Without their assistance, this webinar would not have been possible to arrange. I wish you all keep safe and healthy during these pandemic circumstances and hope to see you in other scientific engagement, either future meetings or research project about inland water ecosystem. With permission from you all, finally, I declare that this webinar officially closed. Thank you very much and good afternoon, good morning or good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. Aogi. Much. Thank you so we much. come to the end of this webinar. We have accomplished all programs in the agenda of the Limno Series Webinar 2020, ASEAN Talks in Inland Water Ecosystem. Before I close this webinar again, I would like to thank everybody involved today in the webinar and the presenter, the participant, both in the YouTube or in the Zoom webinar because your input for this webinar will be so fruitful for us and for the ecosystem, of course. Hopefully, in the future, there will be more sharing and collaboration among each ASEAN country in the term of the management of the inland water ecosystem in the tropical region and the preserve of uh, this ecosystem. I think that's all for our webinar today. Before I close the webinar, please to all participants left here because uh, many participants have already left. Please switch on the camera because we're going to take a photo shot. Please switch on the camera for the all participants here. We're going to take a photo shot with the presenter. Miss Lenny, Miss Michelle, thank you very much for attending today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you. Hello, Yoman. Thank you. Hello, Yoman. Thank you. Thank you. You can see my picture, right? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yoman. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Yes. We're going to take the photo shot. Thank you, man. Okay. Yeah, photo shot. Thank you, man. Yeah. Okay. Please, please, please. Please, please. Please, please. Yoman. Tolong dihitung. Hello. Pak Diki atau Yoman. Hello. Hi, bro. Hello. Hey. Siapa yang hitung nih? Hello. Tolong dihitungnya Pak Deo atau Pak Diki. Siapa yang foto, silakan. Ada yang Pak Nyoman. Start. Counting. One, two, three. Oke. Once again, tolong di-share ya. Once again. Once again. Two, three. Next page is. One, two, three. Next page. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, next. One, two, three. Next, one, two, three. 
the last one, two, three. Okay, done. Okay, done. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. 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 So good afternoon, selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi yeah. wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Lenny. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank, Thank, yeah. Thank you very much, Nakamura. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Im. Very good. Very good moderator. Yeah. Oh, thank you very yeah. much. I'm sorry I can facilitate you well. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Prof. Wan, salam buat Pak Bajuri. Insya Allah. Ayah. <laughs> Nanti jumpa lagi bila COVID akan berakhir ya. Insya Allah. Uh, kita agendakan lah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Fauzan, yes. congratulations. Thank you, thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Lukisan, good job. Thank you. Uh, And to all the secretariat you. members. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, oh, our speaker, next uh, uh, conference of uh, tropical limnology. Uh, it November. will be, uh, hopefully it will be filled in the, the, in the Philippines. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I hope so, too. Yes. <laughs> okay. Next, we can discuss about it. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. For the speaker, uh, there are some questions left. Maybe the secretary will send you the question. Please help to answer because we don't have any enough time today. Yes, yes. yes. So we yes, will start yes, please, the yeah. email to the participant letter. Yes, yes, yes. Compile it and yeah. We will share for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Hey, I leave. Hello. Kata apa apa bilang? Oh, enggak ka. Oh, cakap ni, anu ni, me picture taking. Terima kasih ya panitia ya. Oke, okay, good. Good job. <laughs> Pertama kali nih kita. Iya, Pak. Thank you semuanya. Oh. Ini masih hey, Sikin. Thank you Sikin. Oh.